Welcome to the New Monks. This podcast is dedicated to those of us on the journey of evolution. Through these episodes, we will dive into the lives of individual people and discover what they have learnt and how they have handled their growth. We believe that we all have wisdom to be shared with each other and can learn from listening to each other's stories. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and Apple Podcasts. Spotify, if you feel like leaving us a review and sharing the love, that would be greatly appreciated. Hello and welcome back to episode number 20 of the New Monks podcast. And in this episode, I'm talking to Fez, who I met in Ibiza at a plant medicine ceremony, which was really beautiful. And he told me his story back then, and I just remember... I was so in awe of his journey. It's a really, really, really crazy ride that really does sound like it's from a film, from a fictional film. And so I'm really, really happy that he's here sharing it with all of us and sharing in the wisdom and gems that he's learnt along the way because it's it's definitely been a, a testing ride. So we talk about his father's death at the age of 12 going to prison for the first time for seven and a half months, withdrawing from heroin. It's a journey wrapped in drugs and crime. Growing up in the 80s, influenced by American hip-hop. All the different things that happened to him while he was in prison, traveling and getting caught up, continuing to get, get caught up in crime. And then to completely changing his story and his life and who he is and finding religion in prison in Turkey and asking for forgiveness, finding God, finding Allah and closing that door of crime, drugs and prison and finding a new life in hospitality and spirituality and the unknown of where that is taking him. So I really hope that you enjoy this episode. It's really, really, really is a beautiful, beautiful story. And thank you so much for sharing it with us. <sighs> Ready? Yeah. <laughs> Talk to you on that. Love that. All right, cool. All right, cool. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure, mate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm really excited actually with this one. I feel like it's going to be really juicy. <laughs> yeah, I'm quite excited as well. So it's like the first time I'm proper doing it. And uh, like I said to you before, it's like therapy for me as well, just talking. Oh, it's nice. I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how we begin is just start by taking a few deep breaths in and out. Yeah. And then just tell us how you're feeling right now. Uh, how am I feeling right now? I, I, I feel good actually, to be honest. Very miserable outside. <laughs> it's like it's raining, but I feel good. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just being general. Even if it's grey outside, I still feel like sunshine inside. So. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's I just, love that. It's your mindset, innit? It's how you kind of. Yeah. But how did you get to that place? How did I get to that place? <laughs> well, it's been hard work, mate. To be honest, it's been very hard work. How did I get to that place? Um, seeing the positive things, I don't know, just being through certain experiences in my life, yeah, and always realising that shit could be much worse, mm-hmm. so you know what, look at the positive in whatever you're going through, so even though the bad is the worst shit I've done, I was like, yeah, but it could be worse than this, going to jail is like, a really bad for someone, it's like, yeah, but it could be much worse, I could have lost my leg in what just happened, mm-hmm. or I could have lost my arm or anything like that, but I could be dead. But instead, I'm doing 18 months in jail. So what? Do you know what I mean? So you just always look at the, there's much worse out there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember my mum used to say certain things. I was like, yeah, but you're complaining about yeah. your restaurant. Or, yeah, it doesn't make enough money. Mate, there's people starving out there. Mm. So do you really want to compare to that? Yeah, I know. But I'm, and, then, and then people's argument is, yeah, but that's not us. I was like, 
yeah, and that's not us. So we should be very grateful yeah. that's not us. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's how I got to that place. It's just how I, and, and it hasn't always been like that. There was times I'd be like, oh, why did my dad have to die? Well, well, it's part of life, isn't it? But it's just when you grow up, you become more wiser. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? yeah. But I, I was all right. Actually, from quite young, I've always been quite positive anyway. Mm-hmm. Even then, I was mm-hmm. 1995, my dad's death, and I was still quite a positive because of the teachings and things around me. And my brothers are good as well. And they were like, you know what? You know, it's inevitable, it happens. Mm-hmm. And boom, boom, boom. And when you're 12 years old and you hear your dad died at a party, it's quite mad, isn't it? It's, it's, mad. it's a mad feeling. So, but right from then, it was then, it was where oh, it wow. all kind of changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because of the, when you lose someone that close to you, wow. and my dad was a ledge. Wow, he was a ledge, that. like proper top man. And when, when, when you lose someone that close to you, it changes you completely. I'm not yeah. saying for the worst. Some people can. Some people might take it bad and like you know, be depressed yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. But it changes you in meaning on how you how you how you look at things. And, yeah. You know what I mean? How you trust people? How you don't trust people? How you're smarter than that mm. or whatever? And that's that. From 1995, it all kind of changed. That that I was always I was innocent as well then. But I'm saying that innocence goes a little bit though. Yeah. And then you you struggle to it. You struggle to yeah. You struggle to, what's it called? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm thinking, isn't it? The rice is boiling yeah. man, and I can hear it getting higher and higher. It's annoying me, man. So, uh, yeah, so that's it. So, yeah, so then you, 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 you str- struggle to t- yeah. trust people or invest in feelings. You invest in emotion. You're like, too much. You're like, ah. Oh. You hold back a bit because of that. So interesting. How come you found out when you were at a party? I was at a party. My dad was at a party. Oh, wow. I, it, was, it was really weird as well because my the time of death, actual time of death. Yeah. After when you do the hospital records and stuff, he died at like I can't remember exactly, but it's like eleven forty seven p.m. Right. Yeah. And it's gonna be really weird because that day I went, I fell asleep in my mum and dad's bed. Right. Because them days before with Sky TV, before all of that, it was teletext. Right. Yeah, so you went I teletext. Remember. Yeah. Used to play Teddy Tex games, bamboozle mm. and all these things. Anyway, Teddy Tex was because I was watching the football scores. It was the semi final, I think it was Liverpool, Arsenal, I think it was. And um, I can't remember actually what match it was. Anyway, but I was really interested in the score. So I was like, oh, I'm watching the Teddy's out, I fall asleep. School night, it's a Thursday. I was like, right. And um, I fell asleep with Teddy Tex on the screen. And I remember just waking up at the blue, and I remember looking at the TV, I was like, rah. And it, I remember looking at Teletext and the time digitally and the corner was 11.47. Wow. That's and crazy. I was like, I looked to my right, my mum's not there. Dad's not there. I was like, I don't know my dad went to party, but my mum, well, it's, 11, it's still quite late now. Anyway, and then um, I uh, went back to sleep. Then I got woken up at three in the morning by my brother. Yeah. My big brother comes in. I'm still to my left and right. There's no mum and dad, but my brother comes in. I was like, what is he doing? Fully clothed as well. And then just later I found out he came from the hospital. That's why he was clothed. Um, and he comes in. And he went, you know, um, first I need to tell you something. I was like, ah, cool. I'm half asleep as well. Yeah. And he goes, you know, your um, you know, dad went to this party and stuff. It was like a company party, work party, which my mum always goes to. She didn't go that year. Wow. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, dad had a, a heart attack. I was like, and my dad, I told you, he's a ledge and he's strong, right? Yeah. He's had a heart attack before. And he had a heart first heart attack at 28 years old on a rugby pitch and survived it. From that day onwards, I thought my dad's like Superman, bro. Like mm-hmm. people, you hear about people that have an heart attack. My man just, my dad, my man just brushes it off, yeah. And uh, unfortunately, that and my brother said he didn't make it. So I was like, still didn't register. Like, what do you mean? Remember, I'm still half asleep, right? It's three in the morning That's for 12 year old to be up. Three in the morning, it's like, huh? <laughs> and then he was like, come with me. And then I did, then it hit home. I was like, like, tearing up really badly. And I was like, walked into my bedroom, where I should have been. Walked into my bed. My mum's there with my middle brother, crying and crying and crying. See my mum like, then, then all the tears come out. Yeah? And then she's like crying. And all three of us were on my bed, all hugging and shit, yeah? So I was like, wow, what's happening? What's really happening? All the lights are on, it's late. And... Let's go downstairs. Let's go and get some downstairs. So went downstairs. All my family are there. Like wow. cousins I don't even see. Wow. They've all come out in the middle of the night because my dad was didn't die instantly, he was in hospital. Yeah. And then um 
they were all there. And then everyone started just hugging me and holding me. And then it just stunk in. And they all stayed around for days. And everyone was going and coming in. That's how it is in my family. And like they were just going home, freshen up. They would come back. And they were just supporting us yeah. the next few days. And then it started hitting home. So that's how, that's how I found out. So that was the party. My dad was at a party. And he was always like the life of the party as well. So, um, and, and he never drank, never smoked. But loved to eat. Yeah? And, uh, and you obviously know about, you've been to India. And you know about... The Indian diet ain't the healthiest diet, you get me? And my dad just munch, he's like, ah, oh, you only live once. Mm, yeah, really? Yeah, <laughs> and he just, yeah. you know what I mean? So, so he used to eat, but then when they'd done the autopsy and stuff, the, the doctor did say that um, he had narrow arteries from young anyway. Oh, wow. Anyway, then when it came out, it was like all the details and stuff. My dad died at 11.47, I said, and I woke up at 11.47, I was mm. like, so something hit me when he yeah, actually yeah, passed. Yeah, 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 that's wild. So that was that. It is crazy those experiences they have a massive impact on you, especially at such a young age. Yeah, I was the youngest of my family. That like yeah. my brother, my brother, my, my brother's is like three years between all of us, like three years and three years, so yeah. six years. Me, and my oldest brother, so, and and being the youngest as well, I think that, yeah, I, it's it's everyone has their own journey and everyone ha takes it however they take it. And like my brother must yeah. have felt it. I I feel more. He says no, but I felt it more because he was like. 18 yeah, yeah and yeah. being 18 and you've experienced certain things with yeah. your dad and he was like uh, played rugby with my dad yeah and stuff like that and experience at 12 i just saw that like, yeah in it he must have gone through problems with his dad his teenage years yeah so there might have been more conflict or not whatever mm -hmm. it is so i always feel that he must have felt it worse yeah than me i had just only good memories yeah i didn't really get slapped up by my dad even though he didn't really slap us anyway, but I mean, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. naughty, like, pull my yeah. ear and stuff like that. I didn't really feel anything really bad from him. Everything was, like, good, 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 good. Coming to sport yeah. me at rugby, coming to sport me at football, and a very sportive dad, anyway. So, yeah. I was reading this book, Gabo Mate, Scattered. He says, like, when you grow up in a family, there's no one child who has exactly the same experience. No way. It's all, no that's way. different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why my middle brother was crying a lot, and I was like, you oh, weren't wow. even that close to my dad. Wow. But 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 and when when he opens up, he's like, "What are you talking about?" Of course I was. I oh, used to always think he's a mummy's boy, but yeah. he had his own he had his own relationship with his dad. Yeah, 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 with my dad, yeah. like, do you know what I mean? He, he goes. I remember what the day we had to wash the body, right? And being that young, watch, washing that your dad's body is quite deep. Mm -hmm. He's like, I couldn't do it. He was crying, and I was like, "What are you crying for?" Like 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 right now, why are you hysterically crying? Like why right now? Because I was just thinking about the golf trip me and dad went on in India. My dad took him on a golf trip for his airline Air India and he was a golf and he was just remembering it I was like wow and then but you don't really realize, like you, I was just thinking everything sunshine and lollipops for me I was like yeah that's all good mate you know what I'm saying I, 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 I wicked I remember my dad doing this and doing this and doing that but don't get me wrong it hit me but yeah. we all have a different way of yeah. so showing emotion as well yeah. and and some people to this day say oh, but you seem really cold and stuff like not cold because I but because they, when they get to know me they'll know I'm nowhere yeah, yeah, near yeah, cold yeah. but I don't cry that easily yeah. That could be everything I've been through since that age onwards. Yeah. It's so crazy, isn't it? Like mm. how your experiences, it's like it builds a muscle in you. Yeah. And then it's just... Like certain things have happened. Yeah. Certain close people in my family have died. And it's not that I don't feel emotional, but I just can't cry yeah. at that. And I think maybe I've become, uh, not cold, but I mean like strong to things because of what I've been through, right? Yeah. yeah. And not just my dad, but I mean sitting in jail... Yeah. Sitting in jail in another country, Damn. drug use, yeah. drug use as well makes you quite numb as well. Then it, yeah, 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 it makes you very numb. The drugs I've done as well, you know what I mean? When you do crack and everything, it makes you very numb. Do you know what I mean? If I knew the way my mum reacts now, yeah. then it might have got me, I might have stopped years ago. Do you understand? But my mum's crying, I didn't really feel it when she was crying and screaming at me and shouting at me because for me it was like, yeah, 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 yeah. whatever. But now, when I look back at my mum, I'm like, rah, that would, that should have, that should have put shivers down my spine, man. To see my mum screaming and crying and staying up at three falls in the morning. For me, it was like, what are you doing here? Why are you, why are you up? Because I was worried about you. But you don't even think about them things at that time. Like, my mum's worried about me or she's yeah. trying to, and, and, and you just, you're just oblivious to it all. It's so crazy. I think even sometimes at, at a young age, when you go through a lot, that can like close you up a bit to your emotions. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. I totally agree. Yeah. So yeah. So so I was close up, and then and then when and then and it's it's hard to get back. So when you when I eventually stopped drugs, and I was like, okay, cool. 
we'll probably get to that bit. But I mean, yeah, I found it hard to, and I still do to this day. Yeah. To be completely honest, my mum cries in front of me about talking about her past or yeah, things, yeah, yeah. whatever she talks about. Like, and when she cries, like my girl's been there, and my and people have been there. And we, we're not really that like, oh, mum, you're right. Which is not like that. Which haven't been built like that. Me, mum, all my brothers. And with me, I struggle to even like when we normally you see someone cry, yeah. You normally cry with them because mm-hmm. you're like, uh, you know what I mean? You feel I like you, that. you couldn't no cry with them because it's just emotion and empathy. it's just empathy, yeah. yeah. And the last time I done that I was like twelve years old. Wow, so and that's twelve. I don't really cry, and that was and that was when my dad died yeah. because I saw her cry. I started crying. Yeah. But after that, my mom cries. I don't cry with her. I'm just like, mum, come, you're, you're solid, man. Don't worry about it. Don't cry about it. It's cool. These are good things. These are good things. Get it for your check. Whatever it is. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's quite interesting. So the emotion, the emotion plays a massive part in my life. I've had the ups, downs, everything. Yeah, yeah. And I and I put that down to deaths, like I said, drugs, and what you go through and what you've been through. It's mad. So yeah, you sp- spoke a little bit now just about um, prison and your journey with drugs. I would love to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so so about prison. For people, it's a really negative thing. Yeah, it's such like, a, in society. In society, and, and even the people that have gone to jail, mm-hmm. they're really negative about it. And this is the weird thing, and this is why this is going to be, um, it, it could be really interesting, because I'll tell you why, yeah? yeah when I tell people, they try to say, oh, but you're just glorifying it, or you're this, that, the other. No, I'm not glorifying it, right? But before I went to jail, yeah. This is going to sound really weird, right? Oh. I, want, I wanted to go to jail. Wow. Because I was like, I would love to experience what it's like. I went to a boys' school. It's all about banter. And it's all about everyone just like, like you know what I mean? It, so when I went to jail, it was the same as that. It was like going to a boys' school for me. It was like everyone was, just, <laughs> everyone was taking the piss out of everyone. Everyone was beefing everyone, yeah? And them times, it was really rough. Because when I first went to jail, I went when I was 17 years old, yeah? I went to Felton Young Offenders. And Felton wow. Young Offenders, them days, was no joke. Really? No, 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 no. It was no joke. Where is that one? Felton is in uh, a place called Middlesex, okay. which is near, like, Staines. Yeah. But I grew up around that area. So I grew up in um, a place called Stanwell, yeah? Ashford. Yeah. Stanwell, Ashford, Middlesex, not Ashford, Kent. And, and, and I remember when this jail was built. Yeah, I remember when this Young Offenders was built. And I had a rugby coach. We were for rugby, um, Staines RFC, yeah. Staines Rugby Football Club. And, and our training, he was a prison guard. But you don't realise he's feeling at that age. But I remember him being um, a prison guard, right? Yeah. And he obviously had a deal with them and said, look, can I... He was a coach for our team as well on the weekend. And he said, could I bring my boys and we can use the gymnasium here? So our training sessions were at Felton. Oh, wow. Right? When okay. it first opened, yeah. right? And, um, and I remember just seeing prisoners at their windows when we were walking through the jail. And I remember seeing prisoners and I was thinking... And it was new. It was a new jail. It was like not like them old school nineteen hundreds like Wormwood Scrubs and Wandsworth and stuff like. That. It was like a new jail. So I was like, this must be fun, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. And I was like, so prisoners all taking a piss out the windows. They all battling with each other. Later to find out, these are called window warriors. Yeah, window warriors. They start and argue and everything out of windows, right? And um, so I remember doing. I remember training in these places. Yeah. And um, and I don't know what it was. It was just like. I just love to experience it. And my life has always been about, ah, oh, you know, it's just down to experience. I've always put things in my head and made myself feel better by saying, if it's bad or good, or oh, yeah, but it's, it's experience, it? it's what life's about, experiencing things. And I always had this thing about jail and I was like, I'd love to experience it. And that is because of films we watched. I watched such, like, films growing up, Shawshank Redemption. And, it's, and I was like, I, I remember watching Malcolm X and I was like, and in, in there, and, and jail in America is a completely different, different story. <laughs> You like, you know, it's San Quentin, Rikers Island, all these, like, when you watch documentaries now on Netflix, years mm-hmm. later, and you think, but them days, when I was watching Malcolm X, I was like, oh, man, this, 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 this is where this guy got his revelation, this is where he turned Muslim, and this, that, yeah, it must be. Wow, and, yeah. And, and, and you think these things, so that I thought, I'd love to experience it one day, right? Yeah. Anyway, so, um, and then later on, 17 years old, I get arrested for burglary, I go to jail, yeah? And I remember going, and I was like, I remember this place, and then it came to me that I came here when I was young playing oh, rugby, wow, that's so and I was like eight years old, ten, ten years old, whatever, right? And I was like, wow! And I remember it getting. I remember it this bill, and I remember coming here, playing rugby, and now I'm here myself, in a cell. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. it was just like the maddest experience. So, so jail for other people was is really negative, but for me, you said something when you walked here, and you said, "Oh, it's really tidy." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
my tidiness and cleanliness and all that of like my where I stay, my accommodation, is, was drummed into me from a young age. My mum was really tidy anyway. She's cleaning the house and has to watch her clean the house. And I've always liked to live in a nice environment, right? Yeah. And I always and there's enough people say, oh, you know what? You're clear cleanliness next to godliness. I get that, but I mean. If you've got too much junk around, it's not good for your brain as well. Like, you mean, you've got something clear, your mind will be clear as well. And yeah. I'm a massive believer yeah. in that. You're yeah? 100%, yeah. So then, so my mum was really tidy anyway. And then, so when I got to jail, it was like, I remember the first day. Comes in, prison guard, I remember his prison guard, yeah. And he came in, I forgot his name, and he came in and he goes, you got me your bed pack. I was like, what do you mean, you got me your bed pack? you got to clean the sheets, you got to take the sheets off. Fold them up, they leave them at the end of the bed. You got this, they got that, you got to sweep your cell. It's got to be really tidy because it's the young offenders. They're trying to put this mm -hmm. into you, they're trying to drum this into you, yeah, and get you into this kind of mm -hmm. rehabilitation of like who you are and that wherever you lived before. No, when you're here, you got to get used to, anyway. So, um, and I remember having to clean my cell every day, I remember having to make my bed every day, and all the, even my mom used to make me do it, but. You are tidy and everything has to be clean. And, and when you see people, fellow people, your own age doing this, because they've been in jail longer than you, you just think it's normal. And then from there, it was like, I'm always going to keep my house clean. Mm. I'm always going to keep my room clean. So all the way through jail, all the years I've in and out of jail. How long were you there? Just... That first time I was there seven and a half months. So when you first get taken off the road and your freedom gets taken away from you, that's no joke as well. And my mum didn't even know I was in jail after the first Three what? Days. And it is so weird. I'm like, mate, you're going to hear this one. It is so weird. <laughs> I used to have a neighbour, right? Yeah. And my neighbour was an Irish guy married to an Indian woman. And uh, they had just a bit weird anyway, the couple. But like, yeah. they didn't really talk to us that much. Yeah. But I used to always see him and he used to wear his black outfit. And he used to go to work in the mornings, yeah. And I'd be like waking up and I'd see him in the morning. I'd say, ah, oh, morning, you're right. And those are the days where I used to talk to your neighbours as well. And you know what I mean? It was like quite friendly and stuff. So I was like, mate. I was like, yeah, cool. That was an Irish accent. <laughs> I thought it was Irish. Oh, nice, mate. Told, yeah, it was scouts. Yes, yeah, scouts. Anyway, so he walks to work, and I see. It. Anyway, so my first night in jail, and obviously I'm withdrawing from drugs. Yeah, because I was in drugs by this age. Wow, but I'll get to that. That is young. Felt them. I found out that they don't give subutex or methadone or DFs or value or nothing because they don't want young people to be. Yeah. Substitute with something else, right? And get yeah, into this yeah, yeah. habit of substituting your drugs with another drug in jail. Yeah. When you get to adult prison, they take you on a whole program of like rehabilitation, getting off it, and, and I found that out the hard way because I was in bits. Let me tell you something. Withdrawing for the first time in your life properly, withdrawing because you're away from drugs. Because by the time I was on, I got on drugs to lead into jail. Yeah, I've always had drugs. Yeah, and and the drug is heroin. So when you're withdrawing from heroin, it was a, it was another experience for me. It was like, wow, that this is something else. Now you think about the flu, or you think about um, like the worst of the worst headaches and illnesses and coughing and puking. Think about that times ten. Wow. Yeah? yeah, and it's not just like a day, not two days. It's like goes on and on and on, and you think, what is going on? Your knees, you can't sleep. You're puking, you're going to the num doing a number two, you're pissing, you're this, you're that, you're feeling cold. It could be, you could be in Barbados, bruv, and you're feeling cold. Because your body's running and it's, when you research it, it's like your white blood cells take over, whatever it is. Anyway, <laughs> it's bad, whatever. And so the door opens, yeah? The door opens and it's the nurse, yeah? So the prison guard opens, the nurse walks in, and I'm like, he's come to give me some sort of medication, right? Some sort of painkiller, but it wasn't. It's not opiates. It's like a, not, not an opiate um, substance. Anyway, I recognise him. I'm like, it's my fucking neighbour, bruv. What? It's my ne next door neighbour. Oh my days, that's mad. It's my neighbour. And I'm like, no. so you work here. So all that time I see in your black thing, I see a chain and this, that, the other. You're prison, you're like a prison nurse. He was like, I said, mate, you need to do me a favour. So he goes, like, take some medication. He, he couldn't believe it. He's like in shock. Because he used to see me in and out of yeah, my yeah, house. Yeah, yeah. And they all knew around my whole street, yeah? yeah? And I used to live in the suburbs, right? Yeah. And, and and they used to all know that I'm naughty. <laughs> Police come into the house looking for me, or yeah. groups of friends, and this and that. He knew I was a bit naughty, but being in jail now, so his neighbour, he's a so he said, don't tell anyone that you know me. Because what they'll do, they'll yes. ship you out of the prison wow. and take you to another prison where away from me, because now they can think that yeah. something's linked. Yeah. Or you could bring something in for me, yeah. or... I said, do me a favour though. Yeah. Can you 
to my mum, I'm here. I said, my mum doesn't know. So what happened? I got nicked in. Where I got nicked, you go straight to the police station, yeah? And then I went to court, and in court, they remanded me in custody there and then. So I didn't get bail. But yeah. how, well, you're so young, like... Yeah, but, but you're over 17. 17, wow. You're over 17, okay. so you're, you're, you don't need an appropriate adult. That's mad. So then, and I was too scared to my mum. Because, like, the last time I think I got arrested, she was like, next time this happens, you're out. And then, then, then my mum used to threaten me a lot. And she was used to be strict to me as well. Don't get it twisted. Like, my mum was strict. But I just took the piss. Being the youngest, single parent, both your brothers have moved to the city to go to private college. Yeah? You're on your own with your mum. What are you going to do? Well, not you, but me. I'm taking a piss. Do you know what I mean? I'm not coming home for days. Shit like that. Just in crack houses all over London and this and that. And, you know, I just took the right piss out of her. And, um, yeah, so he told her, next week I know, I've got him, I get a, a guard comes to my cell and says, you got a visit. Who do you think it is? My mum, mm, yeah. Slap straight. In front of every prisoner in there. No. In the visiting, it was slap. She don't, my mum's got no filter, you know. She's got no filter. So, she's like that Indian come out of her. She just doesn't know how to react. She doesn't know how to react. It's because my brothers were never... Well, they were nothing like me. They no, no one's ever been to jail in my family. So when she sees me, she doesn't know how to react to it. Like, does she be comforting? Does she know what it's like in it? Like, mate, I'm scared. I'm in jail for the first time in my life, yeah? You could have given me a bit of comfort. Instead, it's straight up. <laughs> so anyway, I take it and I'm like, mum, just take a seat, all right? And then obviously, I, I kind of break down. I was like, I was quite upset. But you got to remember the emotion because of the heroin's coming out of my system now. So my body's starting to just like get these really weird emotions. Now by that time, I went heroin for a year. Yeah, I think I just turned eighteen, and um, I, I, and so seventeen away. Yeah, so then I must have been must have been that time summertime, but born in June. Anyway, so then um, no, no, I turned eighteen whilst in jail. I done my eighteenth in jail. That's why. Wow, yeah, that's mad. And then um, so she came and I took a seat and I explained it all to her and I was like, look, mate. And my mum always knew that. I was on yes. drugs, but she didn't. She doesn't know the ins and outs because I never wanted to explain it to her. I didn't want to. I was my mum from India. I'm gonna, mm. I'm gonna explain to her what heroin's all about and it's a physical addiction and this that the other. I don't believe. I never. Well, then I didn't believe in rehabs and all that. I just thought it's a fad. It's a phase I'm going through because them days when you talk about crack and heroin now to the, to to someone who's 18 now, they're like, ah, you're a crackhead, fam. You're this and that. But you don't remember when I was eighteen, it was a completely different ball yeah, game. Yeah, yeah. It was the in thing to do. It was fashionable. That's so crazy. Do you understand? It's That's crazy, so isn't it? How no one knew when 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 we when I done it for the first time I was sixteen, yeah? yeah. First time I done it at sixteen. No one knew the depth of it. No one knew that ten years from now, you're gonna have no teeth selling the big issue in the middle of the street begging for money. No one knew that you'd lose everything. No one knew that do you know what I mean? That I am talking girls that you would think I oh, mate, I'd wifey that. Yeah, within a year, two years, you wouldn't even go near them because they lost it. They lost their size, they lost their like, they just look scatty, their skin starts going really bad. But no one thinks at the time because it's such a mad drug, crack I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. That's where it all started crack. Heroin's mm -hmm. after. Mm -hmm. Heroin was like the down. Crack was like you go up and you just go up. It, it, oh, oh, mate, it's nuts. So when you explain that to someone now, they're like, they won't understand it. But them days, you have to remember, we were really influenced by America. Mm, yeah? yeah? The Americans were the ones like, they, I knew was, there was no drill and all this UK hip hop them days. Yeah, yeah, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, there was Roots Maneuver yeah, yeah, yeah. and things like that. Do you know what I mean? We had, yeah, we had Garage, yeah. we had Drum and Bass, we had yeah. DJ Brocky, MC Dead, Shabbat, but we didn't have, so hip, we used to all look at America when it comes to hip hop, like yeah. Tupac, Biggie, Jay Z, yeah, yeah, Nas, yeah, yeah, yeah. all that. So everything was America, the fashion. Um, uh, just like America, America, America was everything, right? They had the best of everything, we all think. Mm. And obviously everyone knows that the crack epidemic in the 80s in America was massive. massive. Yeah? What? yeah, It was huge. Now I've just seen programs on it all day on, but we, I, I kind of lived through that because it hit, 90s hit UK, mm -hmm. yeah? So 98 is when I kind of knew about it. 99, I think I'd done it for the first time, and 2000 is when I was like, Bang, I've done heroin and all that because now you're involved in that whole kind of scene. scene. Yeah, yeah. But still then, it was still wasn't it wasn't class is disgusting. It was still like this is the in thing to do. So in my circle, I was the youngest, but in my circle everyone was like I started drifting, started hanging around olders. And my age was like, Oh my god, this is smoking crap. It was like a big thing them days, yeah. And it all started from like 
people, rude boys, and, 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 and I'm not ashamed to say this, but I was very influenced by the black community when I was a kid, yeah? I went to a school full of, like, it was mixed, actually, white, Asian, and black, but I mean, I, I lived in an area, I grew up in a white area. There's only, like, three Asians in the whole area, right, families. They're playing in, like, Ashford, Stanwell. Now, all the Indians have moved there now. <laughs> but them days, it was, like, quite rare. And uh, then I went to school in Hounslow, mm -hmm. which is, like, a lot of Asians and stuff like that. But, and my mum used to have a laundry in Latimer, like, Lambert Grove. Yeah. So I, like, kind of had different kind of experiences with different people. Anyway, and uh, I was just, I don't know, it was just something to do with the influence. I don't know, I just, I just, I just was really influenced by the black community and the fashion and the music and this, that, yeah, and I loved it. Mm. So, um, and I played a lot of football as well as a kid. And all my mates were like, who were really good at football were black. So I was like, this is my crew, it's my boys. And anyway, so then, um, uh, them days, it was garage music was massive. All right, and if we just listen to garage music and smoke crack spliffs, okay, yeah, there's a club called Coliseum in Vauxhall, yeah, and that was the place. And then Love is King's Cross, it was Bagley's, there was the cross and all that. But the fashion was to smoke big crack spliffs, yeah, and it just for me, it seems like all the ballers are smoking crack. So, what do you want to do? You want to experience it? Mm -hmm. Then you see, that I watched this documentary on uh, Panorama years ago, it's a, it's a massive thing called Panorama years ago, right? I don't know if it's still about, but I mean. And it was like documentaries on what's going on, like teenage pregnancies or this. And there was a documentary on crack in the UK, yeah? And I remember sitting there watching it. And I was like, bro, this thing. And everyone was talking about it like it's nuts, right? And I was like, bro, this thing seems crazy. Mm. And I want to try it. Anyway, by the time it got to like, to where I was living at the time, all the Asians were doing it. All the wow. older Asians were doing it, right? Yeah. All the, and they were like from, this, this, you know, you can people say, oh, it's in the ghettos and stuff like that. Nah, that's bullshit. Really? It's everywhere. Wow. I'm talking, these Asian, like the junkies that you people see now, yeah. it wasn't like that. When I, when I was growing up, all the Asians in my area, yeah. all the rich ones, they were doing it. Wow. And they were nicking their mum's gold. They were getting money off their parents. And the, I'm, I, I, where I lived was like loads of Asians. And they were like rich. So it was a matter of time where then, but none of them really, not many became addicts. Mm -hmm. They all kind of just went through this phase and just knew when to cut it. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's just idiots like me <laughs> just wanted to carry on and get higher and higher and higher. And, and I fell in love with the lifestyle. And when people... Why, sorry, I love that. Why do you think you had that, you wanted to get higher and higher and higher? Uh, I just think there was something, I just think that the sensation was, I was like, this is wicked, and I'm enjoying smoking it, and I'm enjoying the lifestyle it comes with. Yeah. See, that's why I'm saying it was very, um, I think I'm, I was classed myself as a very different kind of addict. It wasn't like that. Mm. It, for me, it was like, it wasn't just about the drugs, it was about everything that comes with the drug. Mm. That grittiness of the streets of London, I loved it all. Yeah. I loved I it all. It. I, think, I think I really enjoyed it. I think, yeah. I think running around and being in different crack houses in Shepherd's Bush, Acton, Labrook Grove, in West London, just... I, I just liked it and the kind of characters that you meet and their backstories and how they got there and, and I never really kind of let myself go completely and that was I think that was the beauty of it and I had a good reputation in my area because I was good at football yeah um, I, 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 I had pretty girlfriends growing up yeah I was the first one to lose my virginity as a kid out of all my circle yeah and, and for me that was like yeah even though my mates were like rude boys and that, I was the first one and I was like, yeah, that's just how it is. I was quite advanced anyway, I was quite ahead of my time anyway, because I had two older brothers, but not just that, I had an older kind of circle of friends. And, um, and, and, and that was it. So I started hanging out with these Asian guys and doing it and they were just running around like headless chickens on this drug. And I remember doing it for the first time. Now you got to remember that what I know about it is Black rude boys are doing this, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's the garage music, and they got money. They're drinking champagne. They're going to the Coliseum. They just that the other. For me to look up to that, and I remember like just the just that urban London. Mm -hmm. I just loved it. But then it was happening in the suburbs as well. Yeah. And so these Asian guys that I who, who I was smoking with, they um, they weren't like wicked characters. Who you think, oh, you know, what? I'd like to be like him. They weren't that influential people. But it was just at that time. Yeah, I was more influential than any of them. I was younger than them all. Yeah, but it was more about. I don't know. I was just having a little fun, to be honest. I was, I was doing it, and I was just smoking, running around, and and 
and not like in hoods or ghettos, just yeah. running around just like the streets of like yeah. a place called Heston, which is nothing. But it was just fun to me, and we were going to houses, we were doing this, mm. we were doing that. It's just a, such a really weird yeah. experience. Then obviously when I got a bit older, mm. like when I went to jail, and then I started. Then then you start mingling and you you evolve mm. in the, that, that game. Then you start getting exposed to like different kind of dealers. Before we, had, I knew one or two dealers when I first got on it. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, can you ring Foxy? Can you ring Darren? <laughs> can you ring Andy? That's free dealers. All I knew. Yeah. yeah? And it was like exclusive. Not many dealers are out there. Now you get a dealer on every single corner of the block. Wow. Right? Now you can go anywhere to get crack. Yeah. Them days, like free dealers. Oh yeah, he's got the yellow one. He's got the grit. Oh, I made that crack. Ew. Now it's so diluted. It's so diluted because so much, um, so much competition. It's yeah. even more available. And, and more available. And it's just like mixed and, uh, and the coat shit and when you're washing it up. Anyway, so then they, and then, then you evolve and you become this and, and then you, you could start your day here. Yeah. And you'll end up anywhere. And you could be end up anywhere in London because you're just running around with these people and you don't even know these people. But you just hang out, you end up just knowing these people. And that is how your little community gets yeah. bigger and wider and you can go anywhere. And from the suburbs where it all started for me, I ended up in the city smoking in Shepherd's Bush acting because you just jumped onto a bandwagon with someone else and start hanging out with someone else and that someone else is from there but then he was in the suburbs picking up from someone like it, it just it's such a mad and I think that was it it's for me it was a massive game it was like mm-hmm. this is fucking fun man this is fun that. I'm meeting people yeah. that I don't even know and who, 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 who I probably would never even talk to yeah, normally yeah, yeah, yeah. but now do it then it obviously starts becoming a problem. <laughs> then, when you realise that, and then you get introduced to heroin, yeah. and the fun and games, it doesn't, for me, it all went all the way through, up to the last day I'd done it, yeah? It was always still fun and games because how I looked at it, and like you asked me right at the beginning, you said, why do you see the positives? Like, I mean, like, how, when did this all start? I even saw the positives in heroin. I swear to God, I saw that, and it's so weird. So, fast forwarding into, um, Rehab and stuff like that. I never went to rehab, but I done um, this twelve step course I had to do in jail. I had, okay. to, I had to satisfy the judge somehow, innit? And then the judge said, "Look, you could, well, the court said you're gonna have to do this course, and it's gonna be really look really good to your judge if you wanna release you." This is much later. Yeah. So I remember sitting in this group doing the twelve steps, and I was like, I couldn't relate to any of them. Really? Like their 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 addiction, and they were like, "Oh, okay. Oh, I just want to give it up." I just, and I'm like to myself, if you really wanna give it up, mate. Can give, give it, it up. up. <laughs> I'm like, and 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 and, and I'm not really talking much in this group because I don't want to look. I don't want to seem like I'm better than them or insensitive. Yeah. And I'm like, and then I looked at it and I looked at myself and I was like, if I ever wanted to stop, which I have done in the past, because I stopped and started. It wasn't all there for us addicts. Yeah. I stopped, started, stopped for like I stopped for six years once. Wow. You know what sure. I mean? Yeah. And then and then and then and then I um. And I thought, if I want to stop, I'll just stop. stop. Do you know what I mean? Not everyone has that willpower. Not everyone has that. Um, it's so true. Opportunity or that chance mm. to go like. Well, like you said, you it was like you were the only one in that group. Only one in that group. Twelve step program in that group. Yeah. They're all addicts yeah, exactly. who are in and out this jail cycle for the last 15, 20 years. Who are in and out, in and out. Some of them ain't got no teeth. No. Some of them look scatty and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm still there, respectable. Got a pair of Jordans on. Do you know what I mean? Sitting there and and I'm like. Uh, can't relate to them and I was just trying to do it and I had to do this course it's 12 step I have to do it because when I, by the time I get to court and they want to sentence me I want them to release me say oh you know what he's really yeah, worked yeah. hard in jail he's a... but when I was sitting there listening to them stories I was like wait this this wasn't my line I wasn't in this I, this this wasn't my life of addiction my mm. addiction was like I had a lot of fun in it yeah you said you saw the positive in heroin positive in heroin meaning so so when people it's not heroin yeah. you, you a lot of them, you see them begging and this and the other. I was always a money maker. Always make money. Yeah. Even to this day, I make money. Whoever I make money, I mean, if it's working or whatever. Um, but I've always been able to kind of hustle something, yeah? And and with heroin, I never had to beg. I never had to do anything really scatty or nothing really bad. I never sold my mum's gold. I never robbed off my friends. Like, you hear these stories. Like, people telling me I robbed my mum. And they said, oh, I've got no relationship with my mum anymore because she kicked me out so many times. Like, that, that's not what happened with me. Do you know what I mean? And so, so the heroin was like, so when you think of heroin years ago, and when I first ever done it, I was like, oh my God, the only thing I know about is Kurt Cobain, <laughs> Jimi Hendrix, Ray yeah. Charles, like musicians that you yeah. watch documentary or read about, they done heroin. Yeah. It's like, isn't, it, isn't, isn't this supposed to be a rock and roll drug then? But you're seeing all these scat bags, like, 
running around like headless chickens, like trying to smoke heroin and banging. Up. I was like, why don't I look at it like that? I look at it like this is the shit. This is wicked. Do you know what I mean? I never looked at heroin like that. So when I done it, I enjoyed the buzz so much yeah. that it's down. It's now people now try to be doctors and say to me, oh, do you know what? You're numbing. The... I was like, nah, mate. No, I felt it. No, 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 no. It was numbing nothing. It was, I was enjoying it. I was in my own little bubble and I enjoyed the buzz. Do you know what I mean? My preferably, <laughs> my preferable way of smoking was on the foil. And yeah. for that, it was like, you be, do you like the taste? I love the taste. People are like, oh, the taste is nasty. I like the buzz, but not the taste. I was like, mate, I like the taste. I like the buzz. I like everything about it. And that was then. Then that became my actual chosen drug. It was crack before that. Okay. Then I thought, no, no, this. So all my mates would like want to get high, yeah. like, up, and then go down after. I was like, I don't even want to go up anymore, man. I'm alright for a bit. I'm just gonna smoke. And my thing was heroin after that. And that was really weird because everyone's normally crack first, heroin after. But mine was like. Yeah, the crack's cool. I've enjoyed it, but I've rinsed it. I've battered that. I'm yeah. not even into crack no more. My thing was heroin. Do you know what I mean? And then, which led to smoking in India and being an addict in India, being in Turkey, going to jail in Turkey for it. Do you know what I mean? Like, the heroin played a massive part my whole life. Mm. And, and like I said, it, I saw the, um, and alhamdulillah, I'm still here. Do you know what I mean? And I still got all my teeth. I still got everything. I still got my health. I got everything. So, uh, I thank God for that, and that's led to my gratefulness and gratitude, and and I think, wow, you got me through such a madness. But I I I, I I'm grateful that it wasn't that much of a bad experience for mm. drug use. And anyone I say that to, they're like, yeah, but it must have been. Obviously, there's bad times. You've had some bad times where you haven't made enough money today, or you haven't made this, and you're withdrawing, or when you go to jail, you're away from your loved ones, or girlfriends that you've lost because of it, and choices that you've made. Yes, obviously there's things, that's just life anyway. That happens with drugs or without drugs. True, true. Shit happens to you. Yeah. Do you true, know what I mean? So, so, that's a, that's why it played a massive part all the way from my life, because I would always go back to it, because I just think, well, I'm going to start smoking now, innit? I feel, I feel like, I feel like I'm going, I'm going to go for a few months of smoking. And then when, I, when I've when i had enough and I've like, oh no, I've started deteriorating, my health starts going as well. Now this is where I've had the privilege of having a family abroad. So I'm like, mum, I'm gonna go to India. All right, cool son, I'm gonna send you to India. That's when I was growing up. And then um, after that, I had had, uh, had made money and I'm like, just go on holiday. So go to Miami, go wherever, withdraw it, get off it, stay there, chill, come back, Cool, fresh. Till the next time. Till the next episode. Now, you see, I'm a grown man now. I'm like, now you don't want to do it. And not just that. It's not just because I'm, I'm older. But the drugs is shit now. So you don't do it yet. Crack is shit. <laughs> crack is, what crack was once upon a time, I'm guessing in the 80s in America, yeah. what it was like in the 90s, and what, like, it was the mm. shit. So mm. even if young people say it now, I don't even advise anyone to do it anyway. I think drugs is bad. Don't do it. There was a time, once upon a time, it was great. You missed the boat. You missed the boat. You basically missed the boat. Now, yeah, you can do MDMA, you can do ketamine, you can do this yeah. and that and the other. Yeah. Um, but, and then obviously yeah. I got more spiritual after that. So from the heroin, it all went to like the wow. other things. So then DMT, ketamine, mm -hmm. even ketamine. I have class that is there for me, for that's quite spiritual. Mm -hmm. I get into a zone. Ayahuasca, all that shit. Then I started getting, then, then now I've gone into that. Mushrooms and I can only elevate my brain and... Crack that really elevate your brain, where it just it just fucks you up, and you get high and you feel like you're the man. But there was a time for everything. Everything has an expiry date, and them things, them drugs has an expiry date. And I now, love that. Everything it doesn't. I don't miss it. Day. I don't miss it. I'm just like, yeah, cool. It was, uh, mm. it, it was it was good. Just like garage music was good then. Do you know what I mean? Them them drugs were good for that time. Machina was good then. Off key, like wearing weird clothes. Them days. If you think about it now, I wouldn't wear clothes with like dogs all over it, but then there's I would. Do you know what I mean? Off key machino. And that, and, that, and that was what London was about them times, where, yeah. I'm, where I'm from anyway. Yeah. It was like, to show money, it's your clothing. Mm. And the urban brands like machino is Italian, but all the black kids was wearing it yeah. because it was the ones that wear. Yeah. Iceberg, Versace, D&G, these are all brands. And that is when London went through a, went through the, it, all these designer labels became really, um, really popular in that kind of yeah, environment, yeah. that community. Do you know what I mean? There yeah. was a shop called Pro Beatles that we used to all go to in South Moulton Street. And this is even before drugs. Oh, liquor move. So I was always quite naughty anyway. 
So I was always quite naughty and I would lick a move, that meaning I'd do a move. I'd, <laughs> yeah. I'd, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I would do a move meaning that I would make money by okay. doing whatever I have to do. Yeah. yeah? Um, and we'd go to Pro Beatles and just, okay, cool, I want to buy this, this, but this, yeah. machino. <laughs> and that was what it was about. Mm. And, 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 and that kind of environment like, that you're in mm. is like all the girls, I, I, I will cherish their memories mm. always. Like proper con. Yeah, it sounds like it was like a culture. Oh, massive, massive, yeah, massive, massive. And that's the crack was part of that yeah, culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like, like, and the funny thing was, yeah, yeah. I remember going to Coliseum for the first time, I was too young to go. Nightclub. But, um, in nightclub in Vauxhall. And I was too young to go, but um, my mate, Anthony, his dad was a doorman there, yeah? And obviously he'd hook it up. I remember going to Coliseum for the first time and I could smell this sweet smell, yeah? And everyone was smoking crack to me. Now, that's at 16, yeah? 16, that just turned 17, I think I went there. And, and there was faces there. I'm talking London faces that I know to this day who are doing their thing, right? From Tottenham, from Brixton, and they were like ballers. Now, them days, mm. I remember seeing him. And then when I went to jail that like, same year, I remember seeing them in jail as well. Wow. And what happened was the people that were there, some of them got out of the crack game, some of them became addicts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So boys that you would think in with big gold and this that, mm -hmm. yeah, but lost it all by smoking because that crack spiff led to piping and the piping just is a spiral downwards. If you can't control it, if you can't call the addiction, you can't control smoking, it will get the better of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I remember these people in Coliseum were like top of the world drinking champagne and see me a year later, like looking scatty, bro. Mm. Do you know what I mean? In Felton Young Offenders. And Felton Young Offenders is the only Young Offenders in the whole of London. The nearest one we have now is, um, then days, was Chelmsford, which is Essex, right? Okay. A lot of people from East London would go there. And now you've got jails in like Woolwich and stuff like that, called ISIS and stuff like that. But Felton, imagine that. You've got a jail, Young Offenders, full of the most notorious youngsters in the whole of London all going to one jail. I'm talking ballers from Tottenham, from Clapham Junction, from from all over, yeah? Kilburn, Stonebridge, Harlesden, they're all going to one jail. Imagine how much kicked off then, how much I saw there. Peckham and Brixton are arguing, Tottenham and Hackney are fighting. Like there was fights every day, every day. There's no TVs then. There was no kettle in your cell. There was none of that, do you know what oh. I mean? So there was like people frustration now, People don't really get into beefing out of jail that much unless you've got something from the role because you're like, you're chilling, you've got TV, you should relax in, you could put a cup, have a cup of tea, you got your own kettle, just chill out, watch the EastEnders. Did you get into much beef? Uh, no, nah, I got one, one of them was my first ever one, which was with a guy called Campbell and he was from Tottenham as well. And what happened was my mate came through on a visit. Coming through on a visit means he got a parcel, someone gave him hash on a visit. Yeah, his visit, I think it was his girl Laura at the time. He comes in. And um, however they got it on the visit, I think they must have kissed or whatever it was, put it in the crisp packet. She passed it to him. He comes back to the wing, back to the cell, and he goes, look, I've got this. It's like, cool. So we're smoking at night, waiting for everyone, to, for the night screws to come on, like the night guards to come on, yeah? Boom, doors shut. The doors ain't gonna open till the morning now. All right, there's obviously certain routines and certain that you know. Mm -hmm. So I was like, all right, cool. So Shez builds a spliff, my cellmate. He builds a spliff and, um, Smoking out the window. Person upstairs, he was about, I swear to God, them days like a giant. Yeah, he must have been about six foot four them days. And that's tall. And I've always been quite short, yeah. And I always remember coming, but he was he was cool, me and him were cool actually, yeah. And uh, but he was like, I'm not even going through what he's going through, girlfriend could have left him, whatever it is, he might be frustrated that day. He could smell the hash coming up to his cell. And um Who's smoking? Shouts out the window, yeah. He's just gonna do my name, he's gonna ask the same because I'm cool with him as well. He's gonna ask me, so I said, Don't say nothing anyway. Clocks it, the, the person down from him or next to him or whatever says, yeah. Uh, it's coming from Thingy, mm -hmm. Fez is so. Hey, Fez, I thought, oh, Yes, brother, what's happening? Shouting back up to him, yeah. Oh, yes, Campbell, what can I do for you? He's like, Boy, you got, got hash, and I was like, mm, Not really. He's like, Bruv. And he can smell it. And he says, and he starts going into Shez, which is my cellmate. And Shez is my friend, my friend from the road, yeah? And he, and he, and he said, um, and he goes, I'm going to send you a line down. They send you a line with it out, made out of like 
your bed covers or whatever. I'm going to send you line, put a spliff in there for me. It's the way he said it out the window. Now, it's a broadcast. Like everyone in the windows can hear. Yeah. So now, if we give something, it looks like we're getting mugged off. Like anyone could just say, put something in there. It's the way he said it. He said, Fez, you know what? I'll bless you tomorrow and this, that, the other. Can you put a little spliff in? I'm having a bad time or this, that, the other. No one's going to do that in jail. It's demanding. Yeah, it was demanding stuff, but we can't do it now. We can't give it now. It's just, we're going to get had up on the wing. Like people are going to say to you, tomorrow morning, I'm going to come to your door and they're going to say, bruv, give me this, give me that. Yeah. So I was like, we yeah. can't give it now. We've got to stand up. Yeah. So I said, bruv, you're not getting it. Yeah, have some respect. He's like, huh? And then he's just, now he went into it, like he wants the kick off kind of thing. I was like, I just have to firm it now. Six foot four, black from Tottenham. A little old five foot four, yeah, <laughs> yeah, from Hounslow, Indian. Do you know what I mean? I was like, Damn. I was like I'm gonna do this one. Now, Shez is like, I'm, I just thought, you know, I'm just gonna smoke this, yeah, I'm gonna buzz out and we'll deal with it in the morning, all right? Oh my word. Shez, I mean, um, Campbell's kicks off now. He said, When I see you in the morning, no, 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 it's on, it's beef, on site, in the showers, no, no, no. In All that show- talk, yeah, because that's the talk, right? So I'm like, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I'm trying to be cocky bastard now. So I'm getting buzzing now, smoking this ash. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever, bruv. Like, I've, I've dealt with people like you in the past. Never dealt with anyone like this before. <laughs> I'm like to myself, yeah, 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 yeah. Sweet, mate. All right, whatever. And I was like being cheeky. Morning comes, realisation kicks in. Sun rises. Oh, I pray. God. I pray, all right? And I'm like, all right, cool. Um, I have to deal with Campbell now. I'm going to do this. So them days you have to go to get... <laughs> Um, your hot water from the serving at your breakfast and stuff like that. So them days, I remember going there. And I was feeling I can't remember what I filled up. I filled something up, right? I filled up with boiling water, all right. And I filled, filled up with boiling water, and I thought, what am I gonna do? So now the screw, he starts unlocking all the doors one by one. We're on the ground floor, so he's unlocked all the down at the ground floor. People are still waking up. People kept like kind of just getting into it. Left. I ran to the servery and I went and got my favorite hot water and breakfast, whatever. Anyway. Come back to the cell, I think, what? And I see the screw walk up the stairs and he starts unlocking all the cells at the top. Now, Campbell's on top of me, so he's gone around. Campbell's there, so then the screws open up Campbell's cell and he's walked down the stairs, yeah? I've gone walking out this with the hot water, all right? Sugar in the hot water. And I've gone up the stairs and I thought, it's going to be me or him. I'm going to get fucked otherwise. He's going to do it. You know what I mean? I embarrassed me with my whole prison sentence. And then when, when something happens to you in jail, it stays with you all the way for the next 10, 15 years. Meaning, People remember you from, I remember when young offenders, when this happened to you and that happened to you. Because the people that come to jail are like always in and out. It's just like institutionalized. So you, the same people keep on coming to jail. And I thought this going to happen. If it, well, anyway. That's crazy. So I thought, I ran upstairs. The screw goes down these stairs. I ran up, walked into camera. I said, what did you say? And, then he, and he's like just waking up, right? He's just waking up. He's in the bed covers. He comes out of his bed. I run up to him and I throw the hot water on him. Yeah. The, the, obviously, the, the sugar kind of makes it stick to your skin. So the boiling water on this guy, yeah? And he starts screaming, yeah? And I remember just kicking him as hard as I could. I ran out and I shut his cell like that, yeah? Ran down, my breakfast in my cell, shut my cell, eat my breakfast. Shed poor guy, because he was like buzzing the night before, he didn't even get to have any breakfast. He didn't even get up in time to go and get his breakfast. Oh, and that was yeah. it. Bruv, he's screaming, shouting, this, that, the other. By that time, he um, he didn't G no one out and he kicked off and the screws are obviously going to see what's happening. He's obviously kicked off with the screws, yeah? And he's got into his own altercation with the security from the guards. They've taken him off the wing. Oh, They've taken him off and that's it. I never saw that guy ever again. Oh my God. Yeah, because what happened was they obviously went to calm him down and he's obviously kicking off and this, that, the other. And they're probably saying to him, like, this is what I can imagine what happened. They're saying to him, okay, Campbell, no, 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 calm down. They set the other. He said, don't tell me to calm down. Yeah. No, 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 because you can hear him shouting and screaming. You can hear the screws. And then you just hear, doosh, doosh, doosh. They're obviously bending him up and he's like kicking off and he's fighting. He's big. And they must have felt threatened. So they took him off the wing. And my thing was never heard of. My thing was never ever heard of because obviously the G code never G'd me up, never grasped me up, never told them that Fez done this and that the other. Do you know what I mean? And I just got away with it. And Why is that the G-code? Or maybe he wasn't. The then. G-code, man, grass, isn't it? You know, the oh, G-code okay, is, okay, okay. don't tell. If something ever happens to you, yeah. you don't go and tell the screws and say, oh, you know what, he bullied me, or he took this and that and the other. You just take it and firm it and you do it yourself. This is Joe. Okay. It's the G-code is Joe. Okay. And, and he didn't tell them, like, oh, yeah, Fez, I, done, I kicked off because Fez 
threw hot water over me. He's screaming and shouting and tipping. He's got boiling water stuck to his skin. Do you understand? So, um, so yeah, he just he, he kept it real and whatever. And I always thought I'll see him again. I never saw him ever again in the whole of my time in jail. Not that time. I'm talking about any other time. Yeah, I did hear though that he got shipped out to Essex anyway because his case was he had a case in Snesbrook mm -hmm. Crown Court, which they take you to that court anyway. Uh, that jail anyway. Anyway, crazy. And that was it. So that was yeah. So so so. But as I say, so the glorifying. Um. Uh, so not. It's not that I'm glorifying it, but I I it was a, a lot of fun to be honest. I'm not gonna lie. Jail was fun for me, man. It was like I'm away from the road. I needed to come here to get a bit healthy anyway. I'm eating. You know what I mean? I've got dinner here, I've got lunch here. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't that bad and and I just needed a break from the road. Mm. So when I got there, I took the positive and then my religion, obviously I've always been Muslim, I was born Muslim, but you start praying more in jail. You start getting into it, you start like reading a bit more about it and it's, I read more then than I ever did ever, ever on the roads. My religion for me then, when mm. I was growing up, was just my mum telling me, you got to read Quran. Didn't understand the Quran, but you got to read Arabic. But I don't understand Arabic, mum. But you know what I mean? It, it, it was, it wasn't, we weren't taught like that. We were like, this is what you have to do. You know, why am I praying? What's the meaning? So my mum my was teaching what she was taught. Now, she was taught as, you pray because you have to pray. Not because <laughs> this is what you get out of it, or this yeah. is why we pray. We have to pray. What do these words actually mean? Mm. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil You don't know. I don't know what they mean, but you just have to do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when you get to jail, mm. they give you books that the Muslim mm. and they're wicked. This country is unbelievable really? when it comes to stuff like that. Yeah, oh, mate. Halal food, Islamic scripture, oh, okay, yeah. Quran, prayer beads, prayer mat. They let you go to the mosque on the Fridays. You can't mess with it when it comes to stuff like that. They're, they're so good in the prison. Yeah. In the prison. Wow. So so. I was getting scripture. Then you start reading, then you start understanding. You get a, 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 an English Quran translation from Arabic into oh, English, wow. and then you start reading and it, and then learn. you start understanding. So, yeah. like you said, I took the positives from that. On the road, would I have ever done that? Probably not. Mm. So now that stuck with me all the way since then. So, so all, already thing. we've got fun, banter. We've got <laughs> we've got understanding my religion and having a habit of being tidy. Yeah. So that's really crazy. It's like it's almost like it did what it kind of is supposed to do. Yeah, rehabilitate you <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. But a little bit. But then the, the downside to that is that you're with so many people and you're getting so many ideas. Yeah. It's like an education in it of crime. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine. So I was with bank robbers. A lot of bank robbers in there. That there was a massive fad of yeah. people robbing banks at that age. Yeah, and also I can imagine like. It worked for you in that way, but not everyone. Not everyone. Yeah. Other people became. I know yeah. people that were doing tens, ten year sentences, yeah. who are now doing life. Wow. Because they just keep on getting more and more and more. Me, I mm. was. Uh, well, my life just started then, didn't it? My life of crime just started before that. I shoplifter. Yeah. So shoplift as a kid. Everyone. Yeah. Well, not everyone, but I mean, people <laughs> shoplift, didn't it? We used to go shoplifting, and, and and like I said, I was really influenced by urban culture yeah, 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 and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. fashion and stuff like that. So how are we going to make money at that age? I'm going to shoplift. I remember my first Avrex jacket. I remember I own an Avrex jacket, I own an Avrex jacket. My mum couldn't afford to buy me an Avrex jacket. Regardless from from a nice family, she didn't understand the, the, yeah. the meaning of like, I'm going to yeah. spend that much money on you being 15 years old or 16 years old and buying a canoe. I'll get you a duffel coat from Marks and Spencer's or from CNA. and a and uh, And I was like, mum, come on. I'm not, I'm not rocking that, you know what I mean? Because I was influenced, but the people I went to school with were happy with Clarks and this and that. I was like, no, I don't want to wear that. I'm a wear... rock star. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to wear Jordans and this and that, the other. It's not that I'm, I'm, I had it hard, I had it nice, but my mum wouldn't, she's not stupid. My mum's like a single mum now. Yeah. She wouldn't just spend £120 worth on, on a pair of trainers them days. I'm going to do it. So mm -hmm. I remember my first pair of Reebok Classics, good ones. I no, 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 sorry. My first pair of Nike 180s was Foot Locker, Clapham Junction. I went in there with an old beat up pair of Reeboks, yeah, workout, workouts, and I tried it on. I went to the girl and I said, Can I try them on? I remember giving her my trainers. She put them, let me in. I'm walking around the store. I ran out the store. I ran out as my first pair, and I'd done the same with my first Avex jacket. My first Avex jacket, I remember going Oxford Street on that side of Oxford Street, not the, not the Selfridges side, but the, 
other side of the ship, right? That's the Oxford Damn. Street. And I went to this, I went to this Pakistani shop and I remember saying they had Avericks and everything. And I was like, all right, cool. I think it was Avericks wannabe. I think it was a, a lookalike Avericks. Yeah? It was like a good flat jacket, a little fur. And it was like proper. I remember trying it on in the shop and running it. I thought, these Asians ain't going to be able to catch me anyway. <laughs> the shopkeeper ain't right. These don't be able to chase me. I was going to put this on and run out. Mm. I left the night tracksuit of top I was wearing at that time, mm. left it there and, uh, and, and, and ran out of the new jacket. And that's how we had to get things. Them days. That's mad. I feel like you're in a very different place now. Ah, oh, very different place. <laughs> very, very, very different place. Because I, 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 I look back yeah. at all that and I'm like, oh, cool. And I smile to myself. I feel really nostalgic and I feel really... I, I, and, and I love the time I grew up in, right? I love the fact that I grew up in, 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 in the early 2000s when things were like popping, things were fun, everyone had individuality. Uh, the fashion was at its pinnacle for me. I think it was the best time of, of dress sense mm. was then. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was just too good. I loved it. I loved all of that. And we were like, obviously, Biggie made Versace really good for us. And all this kind of, do you know what I'm saying? So, um, and then when I look back at it now, I thought, wow, the growth, the growth. Even, even I said something to you earlier about vegan. The growth. And, 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 and drinking oat milk. Or, and and, and I, even up to three years ago, I've never done that. Mm. Now I'm drinking oat milk and because I'm just open to everything. I'm open because before that, so when you're in that circle, in that yes. world, yeah. you're, you're, that's all you know, kind of thing. Jail, crime, drugs, road life, street life. You're not uh, like, do you know what I mean? You're not, like, my girlfriend's from Barcelona. I would never thought of being with a girl from Barcelona. Now, my relationships were all with girls from council estates, or they're not from council estates, they're from that, like, single parent homes mm. and stuff like that, right? And and don't get me wrong, my girlfriends have been wicked. I've had some really good girlfriends, and, like, who have been caring and loving, and, and they've been very loyal, very loyal. I'm just saying, I wasn't ever open, open to being yeah. with a girl from Spain. Or, I, yeah, I wonder, how did you... Move away from that whole. Moving away from that, I tell you one thing. I have to kind of give props. Yes. To a guy called Rizwan Sheikh, Hooray. who owns <laughs> Colombo Group. Who, um, which if no one knows what Colombo Group is, it's like it's Blue's Kitchen, man. X O Y O, all these places is part of a, a chain by this guy and his business partner Steve Ball. He actually got me finding out of it. Yes, I was kind of open to a lot of things because I had two older brothers who were completely different. Yeah. To me, who. Um, One's a filmmaker, yeah. One owns a um, a restaurant bar in Madrid, um, but them days, um, my my passion, not passion, my, sorry, my knowing of films, music, mm. it was all from my older brothers. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? My friends, when I used to play music like The Cure or The Smiths and stuff like that, they're like, "What are you listening to?" And I'd be like, mate, are you joking? This is mm. a tune. But you're, 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 you're wearing Machino and you're wearing Ice Play, but you listen to the Smiths. Like, no one understood it because they didn't have that upbringing that I had. And I think it plays a massive part as where I went from the suburbs, from Ashford, yeah. Stanmore, Staines, yeah. moved to Hounslow. My mum had a laundry in the city. Yeah. Um, I think it played a massive part on who you are, right? Where you're from, yeah. a product of your environment. Yeah. So my brothers really had, give me a really, yeah. they were really good influences on me when it comes to that music and stuff. And um, Riz. and Riz, yeah, Riz, Riz, Riz actually got me away from it all because. So in between that time of smoking, me an addict, right? Obviously, I, I, I the did the addiction. I don't go too much into that, but I mean, like, it travelled with me all the way. So I was an addict in India as well. So I went and left when I went out, when I when when I came out of jail. I went to India. Wait, not when you're seventeen. When I was a little bit, oh, 21. Okay, so this is the second time? Second time. I was in a place called Rochester, Kent okay. prison. And, and when I got out, I was like, I don't want to get away. So I got, I got... How long were you in? In India. No. In, in prison that time, I was there for only four months. Okay. But I mean, I went to India. And after then that. when you're open, yeah, after yeah. that. So when you're open to all this kind of uh, um, completely different lifestyle, you just think, right, I'm staying here. My mum's going to leave me here. I'm going to kind of just chill. And I'm going to kind of... Um, sort my life out. I'm gonna get back on track. I'm gonna kind of sort. Yeah, yeah. So when you're there and you're like, all right, cool. Um, your friends by this time are all 
doing their thing. Some are cocaine dealers, some are working in import, export, some work in the airport, whatever it is. Um, you're in India and you, I've got an older cousin who loves partying, loves DJing, loves trance music, all this kind of shit. When I got there, and I, the India I know was like, it was completely different to the India I got to. Because really? I got to India, I was like, there's a cocaine epidemic here. Oh. Everyone's on coke, everyone's partying, everyone's raving. The people from Mumbai think they're westernised. Yeah. And they're all talking English. And I, like the India I knew, it was like, everyone was like, it was nothing like this. It yeah. was like really reserved and they would like be this yeah. and that. And I and, and I always looked at India like that. And when I coming in, I was saying, wow, this is more advanced than England. Is this about the first time you went? After a long time. Okay, okay. okay. First time we went for after a and long time. And older. And older. Yeah. And then now this time you're understanding that, oh, wow, is this how, is this how they're acting now? And my cousins are older now. He's doing his thing. I must have been 20 actually, 20 and he must have yeah. been 22. And he's like taking me here and everywhere. And I saw a massive... Um, Okay, not problem, but everyone was doing it. Mm. And I remember him giving me coke for the first time. And by this time, you got to remember, I'm clean. Yeah, I've come off drugs. Oh wow! And I'm like, oh no, I thought I've left London to get away from this shit. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Because yeah, I, yeah. It might, what happened was my mum was scared that I'd come out of jail like I did when I was 18. And just go back. And then go back to that lifestyle. Yeah. So she thought when I went this time, go she's like, you're gonna go and you're gonna fix your life out and you're gonna change your mentality and this that and the other. And um, and I was like, I keep me away from this. But, done all right. But what happened was, I got, I, I, there's this guy, this guy I used to play with when I was younger, yeah? Manoj. And um, I'm, I'm from quite a privileged background in India as well. And my cousins used to all play cricket with each other and they said, yeah, and I don't know, something attracted me to the slums. I used to hang out with Manoj as a street kid. And I was like, oh, I love the slums of India, man. There's something about it, it's so vibrant, so... And I used to eat there and everything. My, my mum used to look for me and everything. I remember this as a kid. They used to say, where have you been? I was like, I'm just there, man. Like, there's a slum right next to where we lived. And and it's really bad. The slums in India are really bad, right? But my cousins couldn't understand it. Like, you, you live here in such a beautiful place, but why are you... I don't know, I just used to have fun with them. I used to enjoy messing about with them. And it's like, yeah, man, they were like kids from the from the really bad backgrounds like shanty towns and it was that Mad. but it just showed you that uh, from a young age young, i was yeah, just really yeah. interested in that shit anyway and um i remember going to the um going to the slums one day and i remember walking past one of those little houses and i remember someone was smoking on the foil and what do you think happened it just triggered or something in my brain i was like mate i want to do some of that here and it was more about the excitement of like doing it in another yeah. country like all i've known is heroin and in, in the uk mm. and doing it and i was like you know what i want to do it here so I remember doing it there. Anyway, one thing led to another, and I'm doing it, and then I'm here now, and I'm going to be in India for the next, what, six weeks. To my, I'm going to start smoking. I started smoking quite a bit, but my money starts running out, yeah? So I think, what am I going to do? Anyway, Abdullah Mahal's taking me around um, Mumbai, and they were doing coke. Now, I saw it in a business opportunity. <laughs> in my head, I, I thought, it. I need money to survive here, right? Yeah. And um, all the money that my mum gave me before I left, yeah. Right now, because I've been smoking, I've been this and that, and I'm like, what am I going to do now? And I don't mm. want to live like a pauper, I want to live good in India. So I was like, ah, what am I going to do? So I ring my pal back in the UK, who's selling coke, who's selling tickets. Every time it's like, there's like, he was, yeah. he was doing his thing, he was smashing it, right? And um, I was like, do you want me to do me a favour? I was like, what? He was like, I want you to send me something, yeah? Send me some coke because the coke that these lot are doing, I've done it the other day and it's coming from the Nigerians, right? Wow. I said, this is shit coke. Wow. It's really bad. It's repressed and everything. So I was like, and this is my first business enterprise. Nice. Obviously before that, I was like, I told you, I used to, I used to rob. I went to jail for us robbing yeah. things and robbing dealers and this, that, the other. And and this is my first kind of actual business enterprise. I was like, and it, let's see if it works. And then days, yeah, and this is what happened. I was in my house one day where I was staying at my cousin's house. And I've got an uncle here who lives in Aldershot who um, is a doctor. So his brother is married to my mum's, I mean, sorry, my dad's sister. So it's not my uncle. Oh, yeah. So I remember the door knocking one day and a parcel comes through and I looked at it and I was like, hey, uh, can you sign for this? I was like, yeah, I was at like, home alone that day because Abdurrahman's working with his dad, his dad's at work. Mum's got a sari shop, like an Indian clothing shop. And I signed for it and he was like, what is it anyway? I said, oh, and in, in the evening, my uncle comes on and he, I said, oh, a delivery came for you. It's like a parcel came for you. And I was like, what is it? And he was like, oh, and it was these tablets for blood pressure, right? I goes, yeah, 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 after I've said it, which is his brother. I was like, 
in my head that night I was thinking like that. So he sent something from London to India and I signed for it and that's it. So I thought, and these tablets, I was like, and these are ta tablet capsule things, yeah, for blood pressure, whatever it was. So I thought about it and I said, so when I'm on... When Hold I'm, on a minute. <laughs> when I was on the phone to my pal, yeah. I said to him, I don't want to really mention his name, but I was like, if you can get me capsules, mm. yeah, you empty out mm. the medicine out of it and you fill it up with coke, send me the parcel, send it to me. At that time, my best mate was working for an import-export place called Wilson's, yeah? And I was like, I, and I shouted at him, I said, do you think it's possible? Of course it is. We import-export all the time, parcels and stuff like that, that's what we do. So I said, can we pass it through your work and then you send it to me and I'll give you the address you send it to? And he's like, yeah, yeah, we'll try it. So anyway, my pal's done this and he's filled up these capsules um, full of coke. Mad. Gives it to my brethren, my brethren, my friend, sends them over, all right? Within five days, it arrives. I sign for it, and it's there. I don't know if I come back from work five o'clock. I said, mate, I got a present. I didn't want to tell him when I was doing it, that what I'm gonna do, because I thought, I don't think it goes tits, like, no one has to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, the thing came on, and he was like, what? I opened this thing, and I opened one of the captures and I emptied it, and I was like, I've got a present for you, mate. And he's like, and it's coke, yeah? He'd done the coke, and he was wired. Meaning, our coke in UK is good. No, it's good in South America, but it's good compared to the Nigerians' coke in Africa, right? And I was like, he, it blew his mind. What does he do? He tells all his mates, I got coke from UK, yeah? I said, like, whoa, 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 whoa. Before you start telling all your friends about the coke from UK, tell them a price, mate. I'm selling this, you understand? So I said, boom. I said, give me some paper. And so I started making tickets of this coke. That night, we went to a place called Oris, yeah? It's in Juhu Club. Yeah, we yeah. went there, I told all his mates, I said, boom, I've got this here. That time I was sending 5,000 rupees a gram, I think, or half a gram, whatever it was at that time, I can't remember. And um, that's still a good price, but it was 5,000 rupees is like 50 quid them days, yeah? I think I sent it for more, I think I 7,000, I think I sent it for. Bang, I sold it out. Word got around. Word has got around, yeah, that um, there's coke from UK and it's here. And everyone said it made it's the best coke they've ever done because they're used to a certain coke and they're trying to follow this lifestyle of the Western, but they haven't really done Western drugs or they've, they've, they've been, yeah. So, um, so it gets around and I end up shot into their people. First thing goes, the whole parcel goes, I'm finished with it. It suddenly become, becomes a regular thing. Then what happens to the Nigerians? The Nigerians start realizing that their pockets are getting lighter and they think, what's going on? Someone used me up, which was Abdullah Rahman's friend, my cousin's friend, grass is up for Hajj. He grasped on and said, Fez is uh, Abdul Rahman's cousin Vegeta. from UK. Yeah, he grasped me out and said, he's doing it. Yeah. Now, by this time, I'm living my best life in India. <laughs> Parcels are coming through. I'm giving you more addresses. I'm, I, I'm selling loads of coal. Doing loads of heroin. Right? Smoking loads. But I'm hanging out. And my mate, Manoj, who I grew up with, yeah, I'll get him dealing. He's going from rickshaw to rickshaw all over, <laughs> all over the city in Bandra, in car in Andheri and he's sending bear coat and the word gets out and we're just killing it. Me and him are just doing our thing, right? <laughs> anyway, Abdulman and but at this time I'm in Goa, yeah, I'm chilling in Goa and I've met um I met a wicked crew there. Yeah, Abdulman comes with me as well. He comes back early. I end up staying there with a girl from the UK, this girl that I was seeing at the time, a Russian girl called Sandra, right? And um she's from St. Petersburg. And like these Danish people, and Goa was the place. Mm. And I was living my best mm. life. By this time, I'm 21 now, and, and I'm, I'm just living it, bro. Get a phone call. It's a Nigerian voice. I'm like, hello? It's like, pure African accent. It says, look, we've got your cousin. No, 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 no. I was like, are you oh fucking joking? This is happening. Anyway, later when we found out who it was, like I said, it was a harsh girl, but, guy, but, I was like, oh no, what am I going to do now? Now they've got him. They beat him up a little, they done this, they done that. I'm like, okay, I've got to go from Goa. So I say bye. My friend Nagma, she goes to um, Hampi or something. Mm -hmm. the Russian girls go back. Everyone splits. But I had such the, one of the most amazing, magical moments in Goa at that time. It was like everyone was together. And I was like the ringleader kind of thing, I thought, because I was from the UK, but I'm Indian. And I kind of brought everyone together, and the Europeans trusted. To be with us because I'm from UK. It was like wicked, and the whole crew all living together in a place called Anjuna. 
Yeah. Mm. And it was that like, sick. Anyway, I get this phone call while I'm doing one's back in Mumbai now because he's got back to work. They've wrapped him up, these Nigerians, and they beat him up a little bit. They were nothing major. And they said, Wow, well, look, this is what the deal is. You're doing it. And I said, Look, mate, I'm so small scale. I just do it to this, that, the other. But it was about ways affecting us. So I have a meet with these guys. I said, like, Cool. Yeah, all the money that I made in Mumbai, I had to give it all to these guys. What? Yeah, I didn't want to be. I just thought, you know what? I don't want. These are connected. Now, you've got the go ahead from the Mumbai underworld or whatever it is. You've been doing this thing for a long time. I'm from the UK. I'll come here for a holiday. Yeah. While I'm here, I thought I'll sell coke. Yeah. And smoke. Yeah. And I handed over quite a lot of money that I made. I must have made at least about, for that time, between anyone being in another country, in your holiday, made about 20 grand. I had to give it all. I had to give it all, like, most of it anyway, and I had to have money to, like, kind of live on, and I had my ticket back to you guys, but this is it. Abdullah man, got away, that's it, done, let him go, paid, boom, done, finished. That was the chapter of India, done. Do you know what I mean? That's so good. I went back to the it's UK. Like life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 it, was, it was an amazing time, I loved it, and I tried to carry on that relationship by that Russian girl, by the way, and, uh, nah. It <laughs> and, uh, nah. Didn't work, got back to the UK, and that was it. But anyway, so, so, fast forward again to... The Colombo group. Oh, yeah, that yeah, was, yeah. I was uh, gonna ask. that 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 was um yeah. So Riz took me out of that and kind of changed my whole mindset. To be honest. Really. Now yeah. So now imagine I'm in that circle. Drugs. So yeah. So 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 it's so, uh, so I come back, and uh, I just thought I had this knack for um. I just had a business. I've always had a business kind of entrepreneurial ring. So yeah. I come back and everyone that I kind of grew up with is elevated and they've become like, oh, they're doing their thing and they're driving, they're doing this, driving nice cars. And I'm like, man, I want a bit of piece of the pie, mate. You know what I mean? Every, I, I was just, I've just been gallivanting and just fucking about for the last however many years. Going to India, mad experience in India, it was like crazy. Before that, it was like the streets of London. And I was like, oh, what am I going to do? So I was like, all the money that I spent, yeah? on drugs so you know what I'm going to do I'm going to make that money back how am I going to do it now these are things that I live with and I, I regret and, and ask for forgiveness for but at that time it seemed like a good idea and the good idea was I remember being at the barber shop I got about a million I was like boom and I was telling people about my experiences and this that the other and before I before I left India anyway I, I, I the heroin all got out of my system I went to the village where my mum's from and because um, my dad's from Mumbai, my mum's from the uh, countryside. It's in a place called Madhya Pradesh, near Bhopal. And I went to the village and I stayed there for, I think, when all that happened with the Nigerians. And that happened, I left Mumbai and I went to the village. And then I stayed there and I kind of just got off all the drugs and got healthy and this, that, the other. And that's just another experience as it is. I can get into that another time. But I mean, like, living that village life on a farm mm. is nuts with some beautiful family of members and eating the best of foods and hunting your own meat and shit like that is something mm. spectacular. Anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm there and then I kind of get better and better and better and I get healthy and I think oh, it's time for me to go back now. All right, so I've got no beef with these Nigerians now. It's cool. I'll give you money. Do you know what I mean? I didn't want to get into a madness. Well, I'm, I'm not a man. I don't want war. It's not my country. I don't want to go into beef with you. I don't even care about the drugs. I don't care about drug dealing. I had a good time, and that's what it was for me, innit? So, um, so it's not like I, I, I'm taking... If you tell people now, they're like, yeah, but why did you not like, go to... Like, no, that's not why I, I didn't have the intention of becoming a drug dealer in India. I came here, and while I was there, it seemed like a good idea, and I made some money off it, and I enjoyed it, and it gave me the opportunity to live a wicked life and a good experience in India at the time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I was hanging out in the village, I was thinking about it and I was trying to think about my life and think about myself and I'm still young at this time, it's my early 20s, so I'm like, cool, I think it's time to go back to the UK now, I think my mind is ready to go back to the UK and not take drugs, yeah? Because I think to myself, I've, at that time I thought it's out of my system now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I go back to the UK and I get back to the, uh, meet my friends and stuff and they're all doing their thing. They're all like, some of them making loads of money, some of them are drug dealers. And I was like, I don't know what I want to do. I still don't know. And I still haven't got this spiritual level yet. I still haven't got to this praying stuff. I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? So I still went for another few years now of like badness, but not of taking drugs. I thought I'd make money from selling drugs. So this is when I became quite known 
the police in this country, not as a mm. robber or a drug addict, but ah, a drug dealer. Okay. And then I had, um, so anyway, I so come back and there's this big, big, big boy in the game. And I see him and we used to, I used to buy my drugs off his, his um, operation years ago. And I see him there and he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, wow, he goes, you look really well. Everyone says that you look healthy. And he said, I've come back golden from India. Do you know what I mean? I'm healthy and this and that. Yeah, I've gone to the barbershop, I got faded up. Everything was like, and they're like, boy, I don't even know. I just got back from um, India. I don't know what I'm going to do now. So, and then he goes, look, you know heroin better than anyone. Wow. Why don't you, why don't, you know what I mean? You know. And in my head, I thought about it and I was like, I know about service. I know what it's like to be an addict. I know what it's like to be a customer. Yeah? And I know all the addicts. You know what? Why don't I, what's it called? Sell it to these people. But I give them a good service and get the best gear for these people. Mm. So that he and, he and he's big in the game and he's like, mate, jump on the bandwagon. Everyone's doing it. And I thought, all right, cool. So I think about that now and the next day, and I never paid for it. Next day I rang him and I said, give me something then. On, on tick like bail give it to me like, give it to me oh, yeah, 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 yeah. so he drops me something like seven grams it's nothing now I chop it up and I go out to all the places that I know people are seeing me but they're seeing the healthy me not the smoker me so I'm going to old crack houses all the old addicts and I'm telling them I said look mate I'm not doing it anymore but I got something and then for, for, for someone who had I got a bad reputation from robbing drug dealers and this that the other they're like, oh, what's he up to? And I was like, bad, yeah? Meaning, like, I was like, naughty. People were, like, scared and this, that, they were to kind of do business with me. And I was like, look, man, I've got this thing, trust me. And, 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 and I didn't make no money for the first two, three months because I wasn't having enough gear to do the deal that I was doing. Uh, the deal that I was doing. So the deal I was doing was, like, two, £10 for £15 instead of £20, right? Mm -hmm. The You're size was massive. <laughs> And I thought, you know what, I, I, I'm not going to make money from this, but I'm yeah. going to get the reputation out of yeah, this. I yeah, need to yeah. pay my reputation out of yeah, this. Yeah. Now, all uh, the, everyone knows me as this, like a crack, yeah, okay. crackhead, yeah. yeah, who robs people, who makes money, this, that, the other, who's quite, like, fucked up a little bit. So I need to build a reputation as a businessman now. So how am I going to do it? Now, at that time, it was really weird, because there was a guy from Calvin who was the biggest drug dealer in my kind of area. Um, and where I was living, I was living with this girl called Chantelle, who I grew up with, yeah. She um, had a kid and I, I ended up moving in with her. And um, this Calvin had everyone shook, like everyone scared. And no one was, everyone was scared to, to deal under his, mm -hmm. under, under, under him. Mm -hmm. Coincidentally, I've just come back, I don't know how big this guy is, yeah. yeah? At the time, I just hear, keep on hearing his name. And I got back and I was like, coincidentally, he gets arrested, let's say. Wow. And, and I've just started dealing. So when everyone starts catching wind that he's gone to jail, they can all turn their phones on because otherwise they're working for him. Now everyone starts realising that Calvin's not about no more. They're, they're going to start turning their phones on. But by that time, I took over the whole of my area. Like meaning there was no, all the addicts had nowhere to go because Kelvin's off. Mm. So all of a sudden, everyone's coming to me because mm. they've heard from this mm. person that when Al Fez has got something. Mm. So they're all coming to me and they were buying things off me, and I'm doing these mad deals. So by the time everyone realizes that Kelvin's not about no more, we're gonna start dealing again, yeah? I've got everyone, I've got the custom. And I'm not letting the custom go anywhere, because why? Because I'm giving them the best service. When I tell you I'm gonna be 10 minutes, I'm gonna be 10 minutes. When I tell you I've got banging food, banging gear, I'm gonna give you banging gear, because I know what it's like. And I had the willpower of never doing it after that for another six years. Wow. Six years, I had kilos and kilos in front of me. Right? And, and, and I didn't do it because I just got into this zone and that's when I knew that I'm not really an addict. It's not, for me, it was just fun. Mm -hmm. That time it was like a bit played out and I was like, for me, it was like money now. I need to make money. I need to, I need to get back on top. I need to kind of, you know what I mean? And, and I didn't even get into the bit where when I was growing up, I was, a, into, I was really good at football. Everyone thought I was going to be the first Asian footballer to make it. But obviously, crack, boom. Do you know what I mean? All my football coaches thought, mate, this guy is going to be the one that's wow. right wing. And I was sick at football. My mum being an Asian parent as well pushing me into football was like yeah. unheard of because Asians want their kids to be doctors and lawyers yeah, and that. Yeah, yeah. My mum was like, no, 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 no. If you want to do football, and your mum knew my edu I wasn't really good in education. Like, not that I wasn't good in it, but yeah. my concentration wasn't great. Yeah. And I wasn't just like, my, my mind wasn't into it. She encouraged me to do it. And and obviously when I got on crack and roll, I was in college at that time anyway, and my heart went really into it anyway. So anyway, so I had a really good reputation. I, was, I thought, no, I need to get back on top. I want to get back on top. 
So then, uh, and that time, being a drug dealer is a good reputation. It's really weird, I know, don't get me wrong. Like, you go to a certain society now, and they're like, oh, drug dealer's really bad. But then days, being a drug dealer, like, yeah, you're the man. Yeah? So now, I've got all the custom. Yeah? All the Kelvins, or everyone on the streets of, like, Hounslow, Hanworth, Felton, all these places. Um... I mean, my phone just was blinging and blinging and blinging. Now I start getting big food, and that's when I started making money. And that is when I first got my first started making grands. Is when my connect, obviously no names mentioned, but the person I was getting up right at the beginning who gave me the idea of becoming a drug dealer started giving me four and a half ounces, then to nine ounces, then to half a kilo, and into a kilo. He was giving to me at such a mad price because he knew that I'm I'm doing my thing, and the food is always banging. So no one ever had any complaints. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I've just I've taken it to another level and I've just, I've smashed it. I've made all my money back that I think I spent over the years. I think I, 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 I bought this and I bought that and I bought my car and I've done this. But then what the, my passion was traveling. Yeah. And this is where it gets really interesting. My passion for travel. Um, and then, so this is my opportunity now to see the world. Mm. So I'm going all over the place. I'm going to Southeast Asia. I'm going to that Middle East, I'm going to America, and this at the other, and and everyone's like, oh, you can't go to America, you're a criminal record, like, that's bullshit. There's ways of everything, right? And I was just, you have to just have to talk, and if you ever did get stopped, you just have to talk again, shit, basically, and, and you're good. So I've done America, I've done all over America, I loved it, right? And and, and all the places that I wanted to go when I was growing up, it's like, I'm seeing it now, because I've got my own money, and I've got everything, now I'm living, yeah? Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, right, so, so for me, that all that drug use and drug taking has paid off again. Mm. Because I know this business inside out, yeah, 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 yeah. that it's giving me the opportunity now to travel the world. Yeah. So I'm seeing the world and I'm going here and everywhere and I'm thinking, cool, my business is just, just top, top, top. Yeah, I've got yeah. workers now and i got everything. All right, anyway, not trying to glorify it, but it is what it is, it's a business. Yeah, it's and um, life. then, yeah, and then, and then, um, there's a thing called the drought, yeah? And this is where it all starts going a bit more spiritual, okay? Mm-hmm. And the drought kicks in. The drought is when them drugs are not available as they normally are yeah. in your country. Now, whatever the reason was. At that time, Osama bin Laden was a wanted man. And all this shit in Afghanistan was, like, kicking off. The miracles. And they started bombing all the opium... Um, fields in, this, wow. uh, in, America, in Afghanistan yeah. and stuff, right? What does that mean? That means everything that the so hoping right. that's coming out of that yeah. is coming very limited now. Yeah. And then the route is obviously going from Afghanistan to Iran to this, that, the other. So now, us poor guys in England now who have a business, we can't get anything. And what we do get, we're paying extortion now. And the money that we're um, getting, we're not even getting our money's worth anymore because the thing's mixed anyway. So we're like, and what I've pride my, my whole business on quality, quality yeah. yeah? I can't do it. So I just end up turning my phone off. Now, in between that time, the police have been on to me anyway, right? There's a thing called the SCD7. I mean, I got nicked by them so many times when, and they just couldn't really pin anything on me because I think I was so smart in the way I was doing things, I wouldn't let them get too close. And when they do get too close, they start slipping because they're so eager for you to get you. They don't do their homework. And what happened to the police, they're just desperate to get you. They nick you, but they don't have enough evidence. And in this country... God bless this country when it comes to the CPS and the Crown Prosecution, that if you're not 100% sure or, or there's there's evidence that you haven't got enough evidence or whatever, they throw your case out. This ain't India, where if you're guilty or not guilty, if they want to put you in jail, you'll go to jail. No, 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 no. It's quite fair. And it's in America either, where you're getting 100 years for like this much crack. Like, do you know what I mean? That In this country, it's quite fair. And I, and I, and I, we, I think we all took advantage of that. The fact that, okay, you haven't got my phone, you haven't got this, you haven't got that, you know what? You're gonna get away with it. So they so many times they nick they arrested me for conspiracy of intent to supply and I got away with it. Now I fast forwarded, so I haven't really told you in between what happened at that time, but it's not important. What's important is where how the growth started. Mm-hmm. And um and 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 I and I remember that one time I, I, I was I got arrested by a postman and there were police dressed up as postmen. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my at my girl Chantel's <laughs> wow. at the time and, and they had this massive conspiracy on, on me, they had this like operation on me and I remember it was three in the afternoon and I was on my push bike, I was riding, I was just going for, went for a bike ride or whatever, I think I went to the bike shop, come back and uh, there's a postman, I was like, it's three o'clock in the afternoon, it's a bit late for a postman, isn't it? 
So he walks up to me, and I'm putting, just about to put my bike into the driveway a bit. And uh, he goes, number two. I went, yeah. I put my hand out, take the envelope off him. And it was like, bang, bang, put me on the floor, handcuffed me. Car came from this way, this way. Boom, SC7 went in on me anyway. And I thought, that's it now, this is all over. This, this, this good long run I've had of dealing, it's over. Do you know what I mean? It's, uh, and uh, blessed my thingy, man, to my, to my co-defendants. So I got to Wimbledon Police Station, they took me to Wimbledon, and, and I saw them in the police, I was like, what are you doing here? So there's a massive operation, like all my whole work and my whole flipping um, crew was arrested yeah. at the same time, my okay. workers and everything. Anyway, they didn't bubble me up, no one grasped me up, G code, like I told you, and they, no one, and they all done their time. And they had nothing actually on me because I didn't have any phones, I didn't have any gear on me, I didn't have anything on me. I was just happily riding my bike. Do you know what I mean? I've come home, yes, you think I'm the boss. But anyway, that was a wake-up call for me. Wow. But not much crazy. of a wake-up call because when this drought kicked in and I, I turned my phone off, I was like, fuck this, this is bullshit. Like, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, I'm not selling shit gear. Yeah. I'm, I'm against it. Now we tried, we went to Bradford, went here, then everywhere to get food. It was just hard work. It's become stressful. I was like, I'd rather just count my blessings, turn yeah. my phone off yeah. and chill and get out of the game. And it's really hard to get out of the game when you're on that kind of level. Yeah, I can yeah? imagine. But I always had a kind of different mentality. I was like, mate, I come like I did in India. Like I came, I've had a good time, I've enjoyed myself, I'm out. Do you know what I mean? I do something else. Your skills are always transferable. Mm. Go on holiday. Me and my girl, I, I got a new guy this time. Yeah, all right. Chantel's all, got all my friend. Mm. I was on the phone to just the other day. Like, they, these are my, my, my chicks. Are, I'm very civil with all of them and very good with all of them because um, they, I've got history with them and they were there for me no matter what. All the way through my jail sentences, drug addiction, all of it. They were there for me. I'll never forget that. Do you know what I mean? They were there from the toughest times. So, um, but just if it doesn't work out in a relationship, it doesn't work out. It's not a big thing. We just go our separate ways. So, I mean, my girl at that time, maybe we go to Turkey and we go on holiday. All right. Now, I always remember the roots of the route from Afghanistan to the UK is all the way through Iran. It's like, yeah, when you go to Turkey, from Turkey, it's the gateway to Europe. So when you get to the gear gets to Turkey, then it goes to Amsterdam, London, mm -hmm. all over the place. So Turkey, if you're still getting at Turkey, that means you're getting it still mm -hmm. at its peak. Like, it's still yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. It hasn't been mixed up by all the English guys and all the Dutch guys. It's, like it's still proper heroin. Now, I've been off heroin by this time, by six years, yeah? So long, yeah. And I'm like, man, life's been great, and this, the other ups and downs, raving, partying, restaurants, all that kind of lifestyle that people are into. And at that time, like, in my 20s, in my, in my, my 20s and that, I was loving it, do you know what I mean? Going to Marbella, champagne spray, Ibiza, raving. Anyway, I'm in Turkey, and I think to myself, boom. Something just comes over me, and I meet someone called Cosmo. Cosmo is a guy who's from a place called Antalya, but was in Marmaris at that time, and he was just working with tourists, trying to make money and shit. And me and him start talking, we get on, and he meets some English girl out there about a year before that, and they met, and she ends up living with him and stuff. They're living together, so me and him kind of vibe. And I started telling him, I telling him, I just don't know, I was just in a conversation, I started talking about drugs, yeah? And I was like, yeah, man, I was like, hey, he goes, oh, my cousins and that deal with that. My head, my head goes. Again. And I think to myself, shit. And that's what I'm saying, this, this drug thing has always played a massive part in my life. So I'm there now, and I was like, mate, can we get some? And he's like, it's in Antalya. I was like, fuck it. And he said, Antalya's far away from Marmaris. Mm -hmm. a long drive. I said, look, I'll pay you, what's your day wage? Like, obviously, you're on your day on the, working on the beach. And so I said, fuck that. Cause like, Stay with me, I'll buy you weed, I'll give you some money. And he said, yeah, but just come take me to your cousin's, where he's from, Antalya. So he takes me to this place. Me and my girl and him go for this mad drive, yeah. It takes us hours to get there. It's experience. I, I remember fun and driving through Turkey and shit, like seeing this. And he's talking me through all the way the whole route, yeah, and I'm telling me about Turkey. And I'm like, for me, it's culture as well, but we're stopping over, we're getting food, and this, that, the other. Anyway, he takes me to his cousins, and it's a place called Gypsy Town. It's a scary place, a scary place. All of a sudden, my girl's sitting in the back, Cosmos in the front. The guy gets in. About, firstly, some woman tells us to go this way, and she's like, looks like the the godmother of this whole operation. Wow. Like, go there, blah, 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 and she's like the boss woman. Yeah? Mm -hmm. She tells us, go, we go through Gypsy Town, mm -hmm. and the guys get in, a guy gets in, no, two guys get in, one guy sits next to the wall, sitting, my girl's in the middle now, and um, he tries to touch her up in front of me. Now I thought, there's two ways to go. They know I've got money, they know I'm from UK, yeah. I could kick off, or I could swallow my ego and say, come on, bro, like, I come here to do a little bit of business with you, 
you touch, like, do you know what I mean? Or I could say, bro, you touch my girl, they cut me up and leave me in gypsy town or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Who am I? So I thought I just bit, and my girl just is staunch. My girl at that time, she was staunch. So she's like, meaning like she's that like, solid. She just took it, and then I kind of played it in a way, and I said, that, bro, cool, but don't do that. Like, don't disrespect you. I'm here to do business, and Cosmo started talking for me and this and the other. Anyway, like touching my girl, I was just violating me, man. Like you're touching my girl, my girl's an English girl sitting in the back of a car, and you're trying to touch her and shit. Anyway, anyway, I buy something off this guy, yeah, and we do a transaction, boom, we leave. I drive back, I'm going to get foil from the shop, and, and, and I do it, and it's banging. It is banging. I'm like, raw. Now, remember, the last three months I've been in the UK, it's been a drought. The shit gear's been so bad. And I do it, and I think, this is proper gear. What do you think happens? Entrepreneur, what happens? <laughs> I think to myself, fucking hell, do you know what? We could do something here. Yeah. So then, I'm taking drugs, yeah? And I think, what am I going to do? I'm taking drugs. Um, I'm enjoying the moment. I'm mm -hmm. really, and, and, and doing this and that, the other. I thought, we need to, um, I've got to get this to the UK and give it to my boys and they can do mm -hmm. something and make money. And I can just stay here all that time. We can go to visit Istanbul, we can go mm -hmm. traveling around mm -hmm. Turkey. But now, what am I going to do? How am I going to do it? Me and my girl think about it, and, I, and, and we get my old customer. I ring her, it's a girl called Victoria, and I ring her and I said to her, Do you want a holiday? I'm gonna come here for three days, I'll mm -hmm. pick up the airport, I'll pay for you to come, but you have to take something back for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, she doesn't give a shit. She's like, Yep, yeah, cool, done. She yeah. comes over, yeah, I've got this parcel, yeah. I said, Let me take it back. Now, they got there's a place called in, is a meat market in the meat market. This is where they do this tampering. Cosmo shows me everything, right? Wow. The people that he deals they said, Look, this is the. Yeah, I mean, this is how yeah, you do yeah. it. They, 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 they mask it up completely in a suitcase and they send the thing back, yeah? And um, so Vicky has a good holiday. She's small. She's having the time of her life, yeah? And she goes back. She gets through customs. My, bridging, my friend picks her up, takes her to the hotel, like the guest house mm. thing. Boom, opens up the suitcase mm. and tells them whatever, where it, it all is. And bang, gets it out. Bang, the lines go crazy. Do you know what I mean? There's no drought. more like, Done is like the Fez got gear and it's under my name. Everyone knows Fez's turn, Fez's phone stands on. He might be not there directly, but it's Fez's gear. So then they have a lot of trust in it. So everyone goes crazy. It goes mad. Everyone around London wants to get a piece of the pie, but I'm not having it. Yeah? I didn't realise I'm causing a lot of drama, a lot of madness for my workers. And it's like, yeah, people are trying to rob them. It's like, yeah, but anyway, this thing happens another three times, yeah? And I send parcel bigger and bigger and bigger. One chick gets on, yeah, Freya, her name is. She gets on the, um, she gets on the plane, and what happened was I missed her flight. The flight that she was supposed to get on, she couldn't, she, she, I couldn't get that flight. So she goes, oh, you're gonna have to, instead of nine o'clock at night, you're gonna go back and get out the Gatwick. You're gonna go through, um, you're gonna get in the morning. So what's she gonna do? I haven't got accommodation for her. She'll stay with us, yeah? So I let her stay with me. What do I do? I end up smoking with her. I'm smoking with her and smoking with her and smoking with her. And, and, and I'm enjoying, and I'm smoking this time, yeah? And, um, she gets on. Little I knew, she has a really bad fear for flying kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Even though the way she came, she was cool, but she takes value. Now, I didn't know that. Now, this gear is very strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So, she lets smoke. Bruv, she's fucked. She's like, gouchy and everything. She needs to get on this flight. I might not think, what am I going to do? Now, I need to wake her up. I need to give her water. I need to do this. I need to do that. I don't know how I'm going to do it. Yeah? But I'm going to do this. I'll give her food. Her flight is in like two hours. So I'm driving into the airport, head out the window, Amy trying to hold her and everything. Anyway, we, we slap her up a little bit and get like, come on, come, wake up, wake up, water. She gets her up, she's cool, okay? Now, she gets on the flight, she's got gear in her suitcase, she's got everything. Takes a Valium. I didn't know she took a Valium. She takes a Valium on the plane. Now, that Valium has kicked in, the gear, everything's just, she's a mess. She is a fucking mess on this plane, right? This is what I found out anyway later on. Anyway, she's a mess on this plane. She gets off at a gateway. They can't even wake her up. If anyone knows what Valium is, you take too many Valiums, you're fucked. They're really bad. And um, the Aussie fam and that. So they can't even get off the plane. So now they get her, they hold her in customs. And that's it. They they, they search her bag, no. they smell it. They smell the thing. Anyway, boom. I, don't, I wasn't there, I don't know. So I'm ringing. And ringing, and ringing, my bridging, and I'm ringing her phone, her phone's off. I'm saying, mate, the flight landed ages ago, she should be there. So I tell my bridging, my friend, I said, get out of the airport. She's obviously been bagged or something's happened, yeah, so just get out of there. Anyway, this was the biggest parcel, yeah. And um, and I was thinking as well, I'm like, I'm going to go back now, I'm done, yeah. 
I'm done, you know what I mean? I've been enjoying myself in Turkey, I've gone here, there and everywhere, I've enjoyed it. Anyway, she they, they put her in custody and they hold her for 24 hours. She sobers, not sobers up, but she, when she sobers up, comes off this Valium trip, she um, she's withdrawing, clucking from heroin. You know what I mean? She's in a bad way. No methadone, nothing. So what did the police say? Take advantage of that. She bubbles everything up. This is what happened. They found obviously the guilty because they started questioning her on that. They said, Fez, 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 Fez. He's here. This is what happened. This is the operation. What did Feds do? The police, yeah? They have a field there that we've got Fez. What they do, they call the um, Turkish authorities and arrest me there. Yeah, wow. within 24 hours they come to my yard and they arrest me there and there in Turkey, right? Wow. They arrest me, me and my girl, mm-hmm. both of us, mm-hmm. they put us straight into custody. Mm-hmm. I had the worst time of my life in that custody, right? Mm-hmm. It was horrible. Mm-hmm. They hosed me down, they done this, they done, I tried to get out of the police station, they said they tried to escape from the police station, and uh, so much madness happened. Anyway, we go to jail, me and my girl go to jail, mm-hmm. but there's no charge. What charge have you got? Mm-hmm. There's no charge. Um, and they mm. end up keeping me there because you haven't got, you just put me in jail, but you've arrested me and you've some bullshit charge of burglary, burglary in Turkey, because what happened was I had this bit of madness and I, and I, and that nick, I ended up nicking something. I remember breaking into a hotel room anyway, yeah, one time when I was high. And uh, anyway, they arrested me on this stupid charge of burglary and um, they released my girl. But the English authorities are liaison with the Turkish yeah, authorities yeah, yeah. and they're just keeping me there. Now, Turkey, you think, what are we keeping this guy for? There's no burglary case. There's no this and that. Yeah, but they try to stick something on me, but they're not. Yeah. But you, there's no actual no drug case. So the judge keeps saying, what are you holding this guy for? Yeah. Anyway, my money is all put away somewhere else, yeah? My girl goes back to the UK, and I'm like, there's a way of getting out of this. So someone tells me, like, look, my barrister tells me, if you pay a certain amount of money, you could be out of this. But I said, but, I, but there's no case. Why? I should fight it. Because you're in Turkey, my friend. Money talks. You're not going to try to fight this case. There is no case. I get it. But don't you want to go home? And I was thinking about it. I said, like, I've made money anyway. I was like, yeah, cool. So I bring my, uh, uh, no, my interpreter does everything for me. Yeah. She rings up Amy and she goes, look, we need to pay the judge, yeah. prosecution, uh, barrister, pay me and this, that, the other, and you get out. It took wow. me three and a half months to everyone get the money one by one. Wow. Yeah. Because I, one, I didn't want to... I couldn't, I didn't want to tell no one where my money was in the UK. Secondly, I didn't want to get my mum involved, my brother's involved. They're worried. Amy's obviously telling that she talks to me in the set the other. Everyone's shitting themselves. I'm in a Turkish prison. Wow. Right? Turkish prison at that time is not a joke. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in a place called Mula. I'm in the mountains and it's cold and it's yeah. really bad. And we put in this international cell and I've got Bulgarians with me, I've got Japanese, or everything. Anyway, I'm there now. It takes three and a half months for this money to get to yeah, Turkey. Everyone. In yeah. that three and a half months though, I was eating really bad. There was hot water once a week. We were in this cell, and, and, and my second day there, and these are things that I'm really grateful for now. It was my second day there, and um, Sanai, which is, I'll never forget this guy, right? He is um, Bulgarian in for two murders. Uh, he's, wow. in, he's in my cell, yeah. and he kind of likes me. My first day there, I got a good heart. My, my first day there, I saw everyone living like tramps. Because their families have probably forgotten about them or they haven't got the money or whatever it is. So I've come in with money and I said, look, and they said, what do you want, Fez? And I was like, I asked my cellmates, what do you lot want? Do you lot need anything? They said, yeah, but I bought noodles, I bought this, I bought that, and I bought everyone cigarettes and everything, yeah? They probably like me. And that is why you do good, good comes back around on you, right? Good karma. Because my second day there, I bought them a lot of their things and they came to the cell that same evening. All the cigarettes came and everything. Same thought, this guy's cool, I'm telling my story and telling what's happened. Next day, the door opens. He goes, Rafi, you uh, you got to see the doctor. They can't even speak English. Sanai is doing the translation for me. He's this guy who's in jail for the last 10 years, whatever, yeah? Um, and, and, and he's doing the translation for me, and, and he's saying, oh, they've got doctors. Now they're saying, look, and he just wants to go and see his friends on other wings. He just wants to get out of the cell. So he says, can I come? And I'll do the translating for you because he's going to be able to talk and ask questions about this, that, the other. And you lot don't know what he's saying. And I know English and Turkish. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah. they let him out. And he's a bit of a celebrity in this jail yeah. because of the murders and stuff. And he's from a gang called the Wolf Gang. He's famous in Istanbul. And That's then, and, 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 and so he gets out. Now we're walking up through the stairs and stuff. And I'm looking at his prison. I'm seeing savages, mate. Turkish savages. I'm thinking, what the fuck am I doing here? My second day, remember that, yeah? And um, we go. The guy locks the gate. 
he lets us in, we're going to see the doctor first, then we have to go see the governor of the prison, and then we've got there's loads of things I've got to do that day, right? And Sanaya just thinks, so Sanaya is talking to his mate, it's at the end, right? He's just cracking joke and whatever, and we're in a line, little I knew, yeah, we're going past these doors, now each room is like pillows, blanket, that shit in there, it's like shit, yo. We're walking, 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 Sanaya's kind of walked ahead, so I'm at the back just like thinking, what am I doing here, man? I'm in a Turkish jail, I don't know what I'm doing, how long I'm going to be here for, whatever. So all of a sudden, I get pushed into this room. I get pushed into this room by another prisoner, there's two prisoners, right? One goes in, ratty looking guy, and this other guy, big one, moustache like that, and he's massive, yeah? Mm -hmm. I thought they were robbing me for my trainers, mm -hmm. or robbing me or something mm -hmm. like that. Man's got me like by my neck. Now you got to remember one thing, I'm withdrawing from heroin, mm -hmm. yeah? I'm having eaten, I'm been in a police station for three days, mm -hmm. yeah? Now I'm in a jail, and like, I'm fucked. I don't, I've got no energy. I'm getting strangled like this one behind. The guy comes now. That morning, when the guy opened the cell, when he told me to get there, I was wearing box shorts and my swimming trunks. I was sleeping in, yeah? And they said, no, 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 you can't wear shorts because women in this prison, it's Muslim. Women in prison, you have to wear jeans. So instead of me taking shorts off like you normally do, I put, I put my jeans on, and, yeah? Which is a blessing again. Because what happened was, when this guy had me by the neck like this, the other guy was trying to pull my trousers down. I thought to myself, I clocked it. This is not a robbery. This is a rape. Nice. This is a fucking rape. So what happens is, he tries to put them down, but what happened? Blessings from God. That day, I was wearing swimming trunks, boxers, and jeans, and a belt. Like, I went, like, that would never happen normally. I'd never wear swimming By the time this guy got through my boxers, through my swimming trunks, and got my jeans sort of down, which he didn't get them down, but he got them there. They're trying this at the other. I'm trying to elbow. I'm trying to fight this at the other. Sanai... Who I was good to the day before, bought him cigarettes. He must have bought a stand up guy, mm -hmm. he looked after me, this, that, the other. He didn't have to get involved. Why is he going to get involved? He doesn't even know me. But because I was good to him that night mm -hmm. before, yeah, 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 he must have looked around for where's that guy, meaning me, where's Fez? And someone pointed, this is what he told me after, someone pointed at me in that room. He comes in, yeah, remember he's been in jail, he knows the queue, yes. you know, he knows what's happening. Yeah. He's obviously got a tool on him. He comes in, he opens, all I see is light. It was wow. like, it was like, Jesus Christ, you know, that, like, light come in, the room's open, Sanai comes in, clocks what's happening, the skinny guy gets off because everyone knows Sanai, the big guy tries to go for Sanai, Sanai cuts him from here to here, yeah, this guy gets an extra three years on his sentence for me, Oh right, my word. I, was, I, was, I was looking after him and everything while he was in his jail, oh my so meaning that three and a, I had done three and a half months that time in jail, and, and, and me and Sanai became brothers, that's mad, and then he got an outside court, another two and a half years or three years on his sentence so when i got released anyway eventually i was looking after him because i've lost contact with him i'd love to kind of um to know where his whereabouts is anyway i get out after three and a half months oh yeah yeah and, and, then, and then and then and then it was quite an emotional time because everyone got paid and they said they said you're going home and then they were supposed to deport me and then they deport me and then I, they wouldn't let me get out and it's like really weird they put me in the detention center for a night then there was no flights going to the uk that day so i had to go to amsterdam and then amsterdam i stayed there for a day and then i went to uk anyway go back to uk police stopped me again and they were just onto me onto me onto me anyway and that was it from that day onwards i got a blessing from right jail in, U uh, in turkey and things could have been much worse much worse yeah so what happens is I have this revelation, I think I have to sit now. I have to kind of change. And then when I saw that light that day, it was like, it was like God was watching over me. I was like, this could have turned really messy. And that is where my spiritual journey started, mate, to be perfectly honest. So all the traumas for the last 10 years, 10, 15, 12, 13 years, whatever, yeah? I was like, wow. Anyway, so now I'm in the UK and I think to myself, um, what am I going to do with my life? I don't want to sell drugs. I've done it. I've cut my blessings. I've uh, evaded prison in Turkey, proper prison time in Turkey. Not no Midnight Express shit, like proper bad, yeah? I've just got away from a rape. I'm blessed. I'm breathing. I've beaten crack addiction. Not beating it, but I mean, like, I stopped smoking because it was shit. I got to smoke. I've smoked in Jamaica and Barbados. I've smoked the highest of the high, yeah? yeah? I've smoked heroin in India and in Turkey. I was like, I'm done now. I'm done with it. So I come back, what am I going to do? My brother's getting married, yeah? And um, while we're at, this, at the wedding, I'm there, it's in uh, a place called Asturias, yeah, in North Spain. 
Hey there, my brother's best mates there. Now I didn't know my brother's best mates always been quite influential to me. You know, I've always looked up to him. And this is Riz, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Basically like family, but he's mm-hmm. not actually my family member. He's at the wedding. He's like, what are you doing? I was like, boy, this is a story. Mm-hmm. This has happened in my life. And then, and then, and then. he went, look, mate, I got a few bars. Now I didn't know Colombo how big they were, right? Because I've been in such a different kind of environment, different circle. Yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. know. I, and yeah. he was like, mate, why don't you let me get back to the UK after this wedding? Give me a shout. I'm gonna have a job for you. Yeah. Get back to the UK and I'm trying to size things up and I'm, I don't, I, like, I've been blessed. I've been blessed by, by God and, do you know what I mean? I was like, I'm not, I don't want to go back down that route. I don't want to do it anymore. So I was like, cool, I've had a, such a good time. And like I said, it wasn't, all my friends are, are drug dealers now to this day. And for me, I just never, it, my thing was never, it just was for fun. And it was just like, I never looked at it like, this is, this is me. Yeah. Because I'm, I think it's just my upbringing. My family, re- I've got really good, positive yeah. family who were really um caring yeah and they, they didn't know how to handle me but they were there and just being just just being there and being good people was enough for me do you understand my mum was who visited me in every jail i've been to over the years which i mean i used to go to jail quite a lot and and meaning in between that time just on ramon not convicted but sent there on to be held for these conspiracy charges and then get to court and it's like we free we 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 we're quitting this case. Mm-hmm. There's not enough evidence and they throw me out. But I've still done three months in jail mm-hmm. waiting for this and now just throwing the case out. Mm-hmm. Like, I, like it was happening quite a lot. Mm-hmm. So um so by this time I was like, look I'm gonna I'm gonna thingy, I'm gonna start fresh now and I do my thing. So I ring Riz and Riz goes to me, look brother, um I've got this new venue opening in uh, Brixton called the Blues Kitchen. And I said Blues Kitchen because yeah I've got one in Shoreditch, I've got one in Camden, but open one in Brixton, do you wanna Start work. And I thought, all right, cool, I'm going to do it. And I, I didn't think nothing of hospitality. The only, I've only seen this side of hospitality, right? So I was like, all right, cool. Now, in between this time, when I was in Turkey, I was praying five times a day. I'm in a Turkish prison. You can hear the azan, the calling of prayers. And I get mad into it. And I'm wow. praying at the maddest times of the morning, a yeah. thing called tahajjud. This is not the five times prayer, but it's optional. Yeah. But it's like a really powerful prayer. Yeah. While I'm there, and I've seen the light, when I was nearly getting raped, that light just hit me. Yeah. yeah. I'm praying five times a day. Fit loads of shit could have happened, right? And I just keep feeling grateful. And I just get this mad feeling inside of prayer. And 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 the praying and, and I strongly believe that prayer is what got me away from all of this, yeah. Wow. Even changed my brain. Nice. So I get back and I start working in hospitality. Yeah. I get back and, and my life changes come and, and for someone who's come from my background and my life and different things I do, to be working in a bar, restaurant thing, taking orders of other people, which is cool, but like taking orders of people that I wouldn't even pay attention to back in the day, but like do this and do that. I was a host. I was the host of this place. And like I said, your skills are transferable. So all that interaction, all that service, all that doing, I just put it from drug dealing into hospitality. Anyway, that's my work, all right? And I, and I developed and developed and developed, but Riz, is the one who kind of got me out of that and made me snap out of that. And I was going for a divorce at the time. And he said, you know what, come move in with me. I don't really want you in West London. I was living with my brother at the time. I don't really want you in West London because like, mm-hmm. that's where you're doing yeah. your thing. So I moved to Camden with him. And now, so I've got prayer, gratefulness, and living with my cousin, like, like a cousin, yeah. with me, who's showing me a complete different life. Now mm-hmm. he's showing me a complete different mm-hmm. world of like, play football with actors and doing this and doing that, work in hospitality, people I wouldn't even... Now, at the beginning, I, was, I struggled a little bit because the way I talk or the way I was doing things and really, I, like, I was like, oh, I, I, it's a bit out of my comfort zone, yeah? Because all I know is like gangsters and rude boys and this and that, girls from this estate and girls from that estate and girls... Do you know what I mean? I knew about that world. I didn't know about this world. So it took me time to kind of get used to it. But when you have a character and you have certain skills, Mate, you just you're a chameleon. You can just kind of adapt to all environments, yeah. Love that. And 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 that's what I did, and and I really enjoyed it. But I moved to um, Dalston, yeah. lived in Hackney. Yeah. And there was a mosque behind my house, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Ramadan yeah. Mosque and Shaka Lane. Yeah. And I'm there now, and I'm, and, I, and I'm already religious by this time. I'm praying five times a day. I'm doing my thing. I'm trying to do charity. I'm trying to do everything now. I'm getting better and better and better. I want to work for this mosque now. I want to do a job in the mosque as a voluntary. While I do hospitality, I want to do this. Now, hospitality is full of alcohol, drugs, and this and that. But it's all about the discipline. Now, God didn't ask us to um, all be monks and live in a cave and 
practice Islam? No. You have to be in the firing line, mate. You have to be around those temptations. That's why the devil's here. To tempt us to do certain things, mate. The ones who are strong will beat that. So, do you know what I'm saying? So, so, so I was all right with us, but people say to me, now I'm in a certain community of Muslims and saying, yeah, but you're working on us, but I was like, mate, don't watch me. I'm about my journey, innit? Like, I know what I'm doing. Now, I'm sure, now I've, been, I've done the highest of the high, yeah? yeah so, I thought, no, 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 I'm cool, I'm cool, I don't, I'm all right with it. And um, at this time, Mad. I'm, um, I meet a guy called Egg, yeah? Mm. Egg, right? Erkan. He's the owner of the mosque, and his story is even madder than mine. Like, he, they put him in jail for 12 years for something he didn't do. The police are onto him, and like, loads of shit. And he's been, and I can relate to this guy. He was like, like an older brother, like an uncle, more or less, yeah? And I was like, wow, this guy, me didn't get really tired, right? This is my local mosque. It's like a stone throw away from my house where I'm living in Dawson. And um, I go there all the time, every day. I'm talking to him, I'm talking to him. He's telling me about stories and this. I'm really impressed by him. But I love the fact that he's so cool and owns a mosque, doesn't even know much about Islam, but he's just down with me because he's charitable and a good guy. And I feel like him a little bit. Now. I feel like, do you know what I mean? I come from this, 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 this. And he's been in the, he's really been in the 80s and 90s of the UK and London, yeah? And in Hackney as well. And he's telling me, he's telling me mad stories. I'm really impressed with him. Anyway, so now he's got me channeled into his conversation and his wavelength. Everything he's saying is really like, getting to me i'm loving it he tells me about this thing called ayahuasca oh shit he tells me about this thing called ayahuasca and he says to me young blood you need to do this thing i want wow. you to i want you to take a drink with me wow. and now i start researching now we've got we're, we're a day we're a time we're a time now where google you can just do anything now you could so i said ayahuasca yeah, that day i remember going on reading about ayahuasca and i'm watching shit on youtube i'm watching all this tribal shit and i'm thinking my thing as a kid was always, I want to get higher than high. Ayahuasca is a complete different high. Mm. Yeah? And I'm saying, this is more of a spiritual high. And I've already jumped on my, my oh, journey yeah, of spirituality yeah, yeah. in Turkey, in yeah. this prison, right? Yeah. Hearing that, the call to prayer and all that in the mornings, it just really is like, yeah. I was feeling things. And when I got released from jail, I still just felt, I could stay here. I could stay in this jail because I was so at peace wow. within myself That's from nice. my prayer. Now, when I tell people this story, they're like, mm, you, you, yeah, you say you're religious or you say you're this and that, yeah, and ayahuasca said a drug. And I was like, like I said, don't watch me. It's my journey. And this is, if this is a calling, it's a calling. And when I tell people that's the calling about ayahuasca, it's a calling, It's a right? calling. And I was like, this thing is just drummed into me now. And yeah. egg, I'll bless him to this day. I'll always pray for that guy because he introduced me to it all. Yeah. So I'll get religious and I'm praying, cool. I'm reading the Quran. I'm trying to do my best, all right? Now, there's two things. I'm going to tell you the two best experiences of my life, right? Well, there's obviously fun. I've had, like, traveling and stuff, but was my pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia. Wow. Yeah. I was going to do an Umrah, which is the pilgrimage, but not not a Hajj. But, I mean, when it was a bit lighter do version. I've done it in Saudi Arabia. I'd done that that same year. Okay, cool. And when I came back from there, wow. I'd done the ayahuasca for the first time. Mad. Imagine that year for me. Now, this year, this was about four years ago. Yeah? Four years ago. So, so yeah, cool. Religion's part of it. Yeah, sweet. Ayahuasca, I've been told about it. So I say to Egg, man, and, and, and to Egg, I say to him, look, man, I want to do it. So he arranges it all. I said, well, I, can we do it in the new year? Because I'm going to for Christmas. Mm-hmm. And I, well, it's got, while, I, while, while I'm at work, and I'm doing really well at work, by the way, and I'm really enjoying myself. And it's Christmas holidays. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, you know what? I've got a chance to go and do my pilgrimage. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I booked my thing, and it was the maddest experience at that time. It was the maddest experience. Because it was like things in Mecca, you see it in photos, you see it in TV, you see this and that, you see thousands, thousands, thousands of people praying towards Gibla, which is the black box, right? And they're praying, they're like, just crying and everything. Yeah? And they said, when you people told me, when you get there, when you look up to it, you watch how you feel, like, just feel, feel it. So I remember going into this place and I said, loads of noise and loud and this and by this time I'm wearing a whole thing right the, uh, uh, the pilgrimage attire and um, and I'm ready for it and I don't I, and I'm ready for it but I'm still like scared as well like wow this is mad and I thought to myself when I do this this, this is it now it's done I'm over it's over so I go there and I remember looking down I'm walking in and I remember looking down I remember looking up and I looked at this and I saw Gibla like that yeah and all I got is flashes of my prayer map growing up seeing on my prayer mat and then I got flashes of like 
drugs and jail and this and that. And I saw it and I was like, I'm actually here. The place that we have been praying towards all my life, and then it's that the other who's played a part in my life, all the way Eid. It's that I might not have been practicing all my life, but Eid has played Ramadan and we've done it all. Like my family are quite good like that. I'm there. I'm there. And that is it. The next five days become the most spiritual thing ever. I'm like, I didn't even go back to my hotel. I was sleeping in the mosque. I'd go there and go there quickly shut and come back and pray and read and read. And I was asking for forgiveness day and day out. Wow. Minute after minute. I went, I don't know, I don't know, talk I went from Mecca to Medina, all the way through and the kind of people I met and told my story and told them this and told them that. And I was telling everyone and, and, and it wasn't about even about everyone else. It was about I was talking, it was my first time I felt like I was really talking to God, Allah, and I was saying to him, look man, I'm so sorry, like, like, please forgive me for all the shit I've done, all the drugs I sold, all the drugs I took, all the bad, and all the people I robbed, all the hurt I caused my mum, and it was just like, crazy, five days, yeah, five, six days I was there. How did you get to that point where you realised that's what you needed? Um, what you needed, yeah. When I looked up, when I looked at the Qibla, yeah. my legs went like jelly, it's just like I was actually, and I was like, I was like, all that time that you 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 you, oh, yeah. you, you, you wanna you wanna get high and you wanna yeah, do this yeah. or whatever it was, yeah. yeah. That feeling you get when you look at that, it was like, oh my god, this is better than any high. Being okay. here with all the brotherhood and all the sisters and everyone here, this is like the maddest thing ever, right? And uh, I'm there, and how it felt to ask God's forgiveness, and I felt right. It feels it felt like God has forgiven me. And he's like, man, you can start fresh now. If any clothes you need, anything you need, any wow, guilt that you felt, all, so the, all the hurt that you caused girls in the past, I cheated before, I don't know, and, and all that. And I was just begging, like, every Please, specific yeah. thing that I think I could remember at that time, I asked for forgiveness, and it felt like you are forgiven. Now, people are forgiven. People say, when you do Qibla, when you do them, oh, you know, all your sins are forgiven, yeah? People just say it willy-nilly, but it, it felt like, God's actually forgive me for this. I know I can't let him down now. Like you've helped me through all of this. I can't just say, yeah, you know what? You helped me through jail in Turkey. You helped me through this and that. Yeah, but now I'm gonna put two fingers up and say, you know what? Cheers for that. I'm going back to my old life. I said I could never go back to my old life anymore. That's amazing. And the people that you who who who, who God's had brought towards me, Egg, Riz, all these people. I'm like, right. These were like messengers from that. Like, not messengers, but these were like people to lead me the way. Yeah, God has yeah, yeah, yeah. put these little things in yeah. there in place for me to kind of learn. So yeah. then I get back, I'm in this mad place now. I come back and I don't want to work anymore. I don't want to do that. And that's not, I, 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 you have to be careful with that because yeah, yeah, I don't want to become a much. It's yeah. like too much. It's like, no, you still have to earn a living. You still, yeah. you have a responsibility yeah, in London. And, it's like, yeah, and you've got to do your thing. And I'm doing well at my work. Yeah. Anyway, I tell Egg about the whole experience and like, everyone's proud of me. And they say, right, you done Umrah. And it's coming mm -hmm. from where you come from. Like you was in like jail and yeah, they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you just done an Umrah on your own accord. You didn't get taken by a family. Or, yeah. like, oh, you know what, come. And I was like, oh yeah, okay, cool. You went on your own accord, paid your own money, and this, that, the other. And then, Egg says, you ready to do that thing? We've got a, a drink. We've got a ceremony coming up. Yeah? And I was like, at that time, I didn't want to do it. Because I it wasn't because I was scared of it. Because I thought, am I contradicting everything I just done? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm now, I'm in limbo. And I'm like, oh, no, what am I going to do? What should I do? What should I do? What should I do? I call. I do my prayers. I'm there now. It's a thing called Istakara. You ask God for like guidance and this, that, the other. Iskada, Iskada wasn't working for me. So I was praying and I was asking, like, show me a sign or something, yeah? It wasn't working. So I went with my gut feeling and that could have been the feel. I don't know, that could have been the sign, but the gut feeling was to go and do it. So I was like, ah, cool. Now, I don't know what to expect. I don't know what, I, like, I don't know what to do. And I was like, okay, I'm just like really in, just, I, don't, I, can't, I can't explain what was going through my head that day. I was like, I'm feeling guilty as well. Like my, God's given me everything and now I'm just going to back to do a drug again. But then I didn't look at it as a drug. Everyone's saying to me, it's not a drug. It's like medicine, medicine man. Mm. And I was like, all right, cool. So he takes me to this mad place in the UK. And everyone's there and I'm thinking, you're right. And I said, you know what, just for my own self, I was like, I'm going to, I've got the beads, my that's the and I'm just doing prayers, praying. I wear a whole jubba on purpose, yeah? I do a whole Islamic kind of like attire and I was like, no, no, no. So, I don't want anyone to think that I'm looking at this as or think I just just for my own psycho psychologically I wanted to know that just so God knows yeah I'm here for you I'm you I'm you this, I don't believe in this as my God and this that yeah. the other this is I'm just doing this because I want yeah. to be open up my my mind yeah. to something else and you're following your gut yeah. yeah 
So I'm doing a mind test. Everyone says you've got to do the intention. And stuff. Yeah, my intention is learn to be a good Muslim and to be a good person and become a good human being. And just have closure with all that, yeah? Mm, so nice. I'm sitting there and uh, everyone's like, everyone's doing this thing. I say, okay, you come up. So I'll go up to this thing. I did a drink and I'm like, cool. Now, you remember, I, I, I've taken drugs in my life. <laughs> and uh, my tolerance level was pretty high. I like, can you know? imagine. Doing up, and they're like doing this, they're, they're, they're chanting, they're doing this and doing that, everyone's in there. Um, anyone come up for another ding, doing a come up? I was like, yeah, I'm going straight up, I want some more, mate. Top that shit up, yeah. Now it's hitting me, second drink though. Take the second one. I sat back down, boom. I'm like there, I've gone bang! I've gone flying into another universe, mate. I've gone to another universe, I'm on another planet, yeah. Mm. And I'm thinking, what the fuck, where am I? Now that thing I got at Saudi Arabia and that thing I got this and that the other and all, it was like everything has just flashed back into time. And I was like, boom, boom, boom. Now things that I thought maybe might have, I didn't think they were trauma and stuff because I had such good memories of my dad. And I was like, what's the trauma about it? I was talking to my dad. Yeah, I was chatting to my dad. And it was like, it was like he was there in his room in my old, old house in the suburb. And I was chatting to him and I was like, how are you even in? And I'm like, wow. and, 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 I, and I'm saying, look, Dad, I'm sorry, innit, for everything that I've done. And he went, son, this is your journey, my friend. Like, just enjoy it. Wow. It's cool. My dad's talking to him on a level, and it was wow. like, what? And I'm like, so my dad's all right. <laughs> my dad's all right with everything I've done. So I'm all right. So that guilt and this, that, the other. Then I'm like, yeah, but all that shit that I've done to all the girls and like, done drugs. It's like, mate, have you asked Allah for forgiveness? I was like, yeah. God is the most merciful. He's the most forgiving. He'll forgive you. If you are sincere, yeah, mm -hmm. in your prayer, yeah. My dad was never religious. Yeah. Never religious, but that is it. But my dad, Allah subhanahu wa Allah knows that. God knows that how much I looked up to him and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. He's telling me all this. And I'm there and I'm there and that. Mate, by the time I finish my trip now, yeah. I've gone from place to place and I've gone to different times. I went I went from there, I watched, I watched, it was like I was watching at my age now, watching myself at different stages in my life. I remember watching myself in jail. I remember watching myself at Coliseum. I remember exactly what I was wearing at Coliseum. Mm -hmm. I remember going to all these places, like flashbacks, yeah, of every time of my life that I played a part in my life, yeah. And I'm going back there and it was, a, it wasn't a healing, but it was like, a, just mm -hmm. a, it was like so, such a beautiful, beautiful yeah. feeling to go to these places and visit these places i guess also it's like being at peace with your journey mm. I was, I was, I, I, and, and it's so right you're right because i was at peace with it and i was like yeah i was like oh man but i've done this i've done that it's like at peace it's like look it is what it is yeah man what else can you do what yeah. are you gonna go it's not it's my name is earl i'm gonna go to every single person i've done yeah. a, a bad to and i'm gonna say i'll ask for forgiveness no, i'm gonna ask god for forgiveness yeah. and i hope you can put good forgiveness in yeah. their heart so yeah. they don't think bad of me. And forgive yourself. Forgive myself for everything I've done. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I forgive myself for putting my body through what I put it through and all the shit I've done and hurting my mind. Like, forgive myself. Mm -hmm. And then that is it. And then from there, That's ayahuasca, I've done another two drinks after that. And um, and it's just getting better and better, to be perfectly honest. It's, <laughs> it's just getting better and better because I'm going, I'm, I'm going to things that I forgot all about yeah. that you're going to. I'm talking like, my dad's touch, I, can, I remember touching my dad's wow. beard as a kid, and I'm feeling that, I can feel my dad, and I'm like, oh my God, this is well weird. But my, my, my journey is just, I think it's just started now, like, it's, it's... Wow. Yeah, I think I need another, I think I'm going to do another three or four drinks, or well, I don't know, I'm going to Mexico, I'm going to do it there again. Yeah. And, I, and, and, I, and, I, and I just want to, I don't know what I'm actually looking for, mm. but it has put closure yes. on yeah. the drugs I took, it's put closure on life of crime. Wow, wow. It's, it, it, it's made me think that I, I don't feel I'd ever, even if the hardest of times, I'd never drug deal again. Yeah. I, I don't feel I'd ever smoke crack again. Yeah. I'd never smoke heroin again. I'd never do any of that shit again. Because it's been such a mad journey and this is such a way to kind of, to close that door. Ooh. I'll be honest with you, it was my religion and ayahuasca together. Putting them together is like, I closed that door. But, yeah. I'm, I, but I'm happy about that. I'm yeah, happy yeah, what was yeah. in that room. Yeah, love that. I think that's really important. Yeah. But why do you, do you have any like reflection on like, because I feel like sometimes, you know, they say that you, you choose your path before you come into this life. 
I know it's not. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, none of those. So we had the similar thing in Islam. Okay, okay. We say, we say, what's it, what's your your qadr? Which is like the, yeah. your what's your fate? Yeah? yeah. So what's written is written. Yeah. And then and then they say that your prayer can change the the journey. Yes. It can yeah, change yeah. the journey, and it depends on how sincere it is. I but um, uh, I I do believe, and I think I I I. I, I I, yeah, you're right. Because I question it, and I can't yeah. answer certain questions. I was gonna say, where I, do you think? I, I can't answer certain questions because they, you know, like there's no. I'm not one of them kind of people that yeah. blags it and says, yeah, 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 this that. No, if I don't know something, I won't. Yeah. I don't. I tell you, I don't know it. Where but, do you think, like all everything you've experienced? Because the thing is, not many people get to have that kind of experience in life, right? Hmm. Some people just do that thing and just work and like yeah, have a very right, peaceful life. And you know, peaceful life. Yeah. Where, and, and 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 I think. Where do you think this is like taking you? Um, I, I, to be honest with you, I, I, I can't, I, I, I really don't know. And I, I can honestly, I don't know, but I knew all the way from, from a young age though, yeah. that my life was never going to be mediocre. I remember sitting in, I remember sitting in, in my classroom in my, in, in college yeah. and stuff like that. And places I've been to, even in jail and stuff. I mean, I was sitting in association mm. and, sitting, and I was watching everyone and watching everyone's back and just trying to picture everyone's backstory and think where life they've come from and what life mm, they've lived yeah, and yeah. With their backgrounds and I was like, I, I, I just can't, I don't see it's myself not me. here. It's not me. <laughs> and I was always, a, I was always yeah. a, what's it called? I was always like, not a loner, but I mean, I always had crews yeah, yeah, yeah. and clicks, but I never just was into one. I was yeah. just like float. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, always yeah, floated yeah. through so life. That, yeah. And, 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 I, and I think that, and I, so I, right now, I don't know, like, my life changed in, in since I've been in hospitality and leaving that. Mm-hmm. And when I moved out of West London, Possibly and I said, and, and it changed massively. Yeah. And even the things, even the things I do, and and then I met my girl, Mad. and she she brought a whole complete different spin on the game. Mm-hmm. Cause she's from Barcelona, mm-hmm. and then that was open to this that they were like things that I would never even think of, like the thing about vegan and yeah. this and that. And that all changed, and my whole outlook changed, and then. Um, the way I was even with my relationships with yeah. my exes, I never gave that much love to them and this, that, the other. And I, and I feel bad for the way I am, how I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. how I am now. Cause, but it wasn't their time, it wasn't yeah. our time, it yeah. didn't work, it yeah. didn't work, it is what it is. Yeah. But how I look at the world now is completely different to how I looked at it back yeah. in the day. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, I think it's amazing that you are still so open to it. You, like, you don't know because that's also very... Um, when you tune into the possibility, you know, it's like, like there's, you can go anywhere from there. Yeah, 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 yeah. and that's where I'm at. Yeah, I'm at, I'm at, I'm at, the, I'm at the, not a crossroad because it's, I don't know where I'm at, but yeah. right now, especially now with this pandemic and mm. and what's happening in the world, yeah, I'm man. just gonna live every day as it yeah. comes. I'm gonna fuck off to Mexico and I'm gonna chill. I don't know when I'm gonna come back, but I'm gonna do that for now, and hopefully yeah. my next drink. Will, will guide me because right now I just yeah I get I get my faith gets stronger and stronger Love but it. I mean the drink I think will guide me yeah. to I'm, where yeah. I need to go next I'm excited to see where mm. your journey is going to take you <laughs> I'm excited as well to be perfectly honest well thank you so much for sharing no, no, mate it's, uh, it is, it's been yeah it's been amazing I loved it I've actually really loved it oh, I like talking good. it brought back oh. some memories and it brought back yeah. some um, some good yeah good times actually I'm just going to ask you two more questions go on do you have any advice for anyone who's going, who could be going through something similar? Oh, like mate, I, 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 how long have you got? <laughs> but now, the yeah, advice, the, sure. yeah, <laughs> no, 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 the advice is, I'll be honest with you, the advice is that, I know this is really cliche, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. However, however, yeah, however you take your experiences, what you're going through, yeah? Now, yeah. I, 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 I don't have a massive following on Instagram, but the people that are on my Instagram and stuff like that. Yeah, your Instagram is amazing. Yeah. Everyone follow first. <laughs> it, 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 it's it is, so good. It, it's, it's more about the people that are where I'm from, or be anyone, yeah? yeah, is that if you people know where I come from, yes. to, to be able to, to broaden their horizons. Now, you'd think a little Indian boy from the suburbs, yeah. this, that, the other, who, 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 who's travelled how I travel and see things how I see things, and that, that don't just think that your thing's limited because you're from a shitty little town. Or mm. shitty little town. You, mate, the world is your oyster. The like, world I'm, is your oyster. Yeah, and I mean that. Like, I would never <laughs> think I would be here, there, and everywhere doing my that. thing. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. I want people to understand that, that you could be a crackhead one day, the next day you could be a flipping traveling the world, mate. Like, it happens. There, There is a way and chance of yeah. doing that. You just have to yeah. kind of just know what you want, focus, and think, you know what? 
I don't want, like, it's hard to be on drugs and travel. Trust me, it is. Yeah, as much as people would love to do it, it's hard to be on drugs like that and travel. Yeah, but you have to kind of put the pipe down. Yeah, and then you have to think, you know what? What do I want more? The high, is it? Am I getting high anymore? Am I really enjoying this buzz anymore? Um, yeah, yeah. It I'm sounds, not. It sounds like you found such a, a deeper meaning. Yeah, yeah. So much more deeper than yeah. smoking crack. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and much, much more deeper than the biggest one is money. You know what I mean? Everyone oh, thinks, yeah, yeah, crack, okay, that's a high, but everyone's money. chasing this rat race. Everyone's chasing yeah. the money. Everyone's chasing the money. I was like, I want something much more deeper than this. That's so yeah? true. And I was like, oh, I, I, and you know what? That deepness is that whether I sleep in a tent or sleep in a five-star hotel or whatever, there's so much more out there. And, 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 and then fucking chasing the money, man. That's it. That's, 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 my, that's, that's, that's my advice, that there is light in the end of the yeah. tunnel and you can keep it moving and you Love can do that. so many other things. Mm. Nice. And then one more. What does freedom mean to you? Freedom, wow. It goes back, see, now I just had a flashback now yeah. of the, the screw, um, the, the guard saying to me, Fez, um, I said, God, I need to have a shower. No, 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 it's banger. It's lockdown. The whole jail's locked down. I said, what do you mean it's locked down? There's been this and that. There's someone's been stabbed on the other wing, so they've locked the whole jail down. And I remember sitting there thinking, I just want to have a shower. I just want to have, and I have to ask and beg and still don't get the opportunity to have a shower sitting in jail. So that, that cell That's is, it is, is, a, a, is a, a representative of the life that I was living, that you're trapped, that I have to ask someone to go and have a shower or I have to do this and do that. Now, freedom for me now is one, I got no police mm. on my back. Mm. I've got no conspiracy theory, like conspiracy theories, conspiracy <laughs> cases, cases on me. Yeah. I got no um I got my <laughs> mum happy. Every time I see her, I can see joy in her and that the journey yeah. that I've uh, what I've been on and where I've come mm. from. My brothers, me and my brothers weren't that close, like we've always been close, but the way I talk to them now is completely different because they look at me as like mm. an adult now and a man now. Mm. Who's, uh, do you know what I mean? Before that they see me in and out of the house, this, that, the other. Um and, and and I'm ex not, I don't need acceptance, but I mean accepted by all societies. Like, I could go back to the hood and that, and, and, and they're junkies. I've got love from them, I've got love from this yeah, person, I've got man. love from that person. Um, and, and just the being, being able to um, just wake up every day, be happy, mm. and, 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 and really, and then I mean this, I know people just say it, but I just smile every day, and I'm like, wow, man, what a fucking journey it's been, mate. Do you know what I mean? What's freedom for me, man. Freedom for me is like be able to, you know what I mean? Mic drop. <laughs> Mic drop, completely. Yeah, and I feel like it might, your um, definition of freedom must be so different from going to prison, you know? Yeah, so of course, of course, of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah, it's been emotional, mate. It's been, it's been, it's been a roller coaster, but yeah. we're out here, innit? We're here. We out here living. We're out here, we live it, we live it, we live it. <laughs> Wait, what mean? was the thing that you kept saying? Um, it's my life. Just, no, 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 no. It's just what we do, isn't it? It's what life. we do. <laughs> oh, mate, yeah. That was a joke. That was a joke. That was an ayahuasca thing in Ibiza. Yeah, we had an ayahuasca ceremony together. Mm. That was a good one still. I, went, I buzzed out on that one. I, I went to another planet. Mm. You remember, I told you I went to another planet. Cool. Thank you very much, mate. Thank you. No, no, Amazing thank you. story. Cheers. Any final words? <laughs> No, 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 just love and light, mate, to everyone. I'm telling mm, you. Yeah. Show love, innit? Thank you. Show love, man. Yeah, and receive it. And receive it, of course. Yeah. Of course, and be good, mate. Be good. Yeah. I'm telling you, be good. Just be a good human being, man. Yeah. Love it. Thank you so much.